On July 5th, 2011, a Florida jury found Casey Anthony not guilty of counts one through three regarding first degree murder, aggravated manslaughter of a child, and aggravated child abuse. The mother of the two-year-old girl she was accused of killing sobbed in the courtroom. Casey's parents, Cindy and George Anthony, left the courtroom as the judge read further instructions to the jury. They did not approach their daughter or talk to her or celebrate her being found innocent. Outside of the courtroom, spectators awaiting the verdict were devastated. People comforted each other and cried, one man remarking that Casey Anthony should leave town because she's not welcome in Orlando. One woman said the verdict is going to make millions of people think they can get away with killing their child. That isn't a good depiction of what our justice system is like or should be. Another woman said, I just think it's going to make millions of people think they can get away with killing their child or committing major crimes and getting away with it. This isn't a good depiction of what our justice system is like or should be. Pretty consistent response there in New York Times Square. A huge crowd had gathered to watch the verdict on the giant TV monitors. The reaction was outraged as well. I'm sick, you know. She killed a little girl, said one one. So she gets off and she goes home and maybe has another baby that she can abuse and hurt. Casey was found guilty on counts four through seven for providing false information to law enforcement. After getting credit for time served during the trial, Casey is released from prison 12 days later on July 17th, 2011. And a lot of people have been pretty pissed off ever since about it. Did the jury get it wrong that day? I certainly think they did after looking it all over. If listening to a tale of someone obviously getting away with murder, in my opinion, uh, upsets you, then I think there was a very good chance that today's tale is going to get you pretty fired up. I found this story uh, strangely riveting, though, as well. Draw your own conclusions and hear mine today on a how in the hell did this happen edition of Time Suck. You're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, meat sacks. Work and wait. It's time for time suck. Sorry about my voice. Nothing I can do. Man, this is a this is a cold that will not go away. I don't know what's going on in your uh, your neck of the woods, but up here in Idaho, uh, actually a lot of places I've been traveling, it is just the cold that will not end. I've talked to so many people, so many people who have the exact. Lindsay has it. Joe, Reverend Doctor Joe had it. Uh, just went to the grocery store this morning, got some more cold medicine. That lady had it. Working the checkout register. She she said that everybody she knows has had it. Nasty. Just lingers. Uh, thanks to our space listeners again for supporting the show via Patreon and for letting us donate $1,800 this month to BACA, Bikers Against Child Abuse. Felt right to donate to BACA after the pedophile island and Pedro Lopez sucks. And with Casey Anthony uh, right now, just feels good to give to an organization that is uh, working to prevent child abuse. Uh, link in the episode description if you want to learn more about this wonderful organization or donate yourself. I'm Dan Cummins. Suck nasty. Profit and Imran. Ball sack of Bojangles, and you are listening to Time Suck. Welcome to the cult of the curious. Hail Nimrod. I praise, praise Triple M. Hail Lucifina. Praise Bojangles. Hope you're ready for a tale that is equal parts fascinating and frustrating today. Uh, thank you for all the recent ratings and reviews. Really helped spread the suck, and the suck is spreading. Met so many great time suckers on the road lately who have gotten their entire shop or office or construction site listening to the show. Hail Nimrod. Uh, recording this in advance of the Tom and Dan cruise. Tom and Dan from the fantastic podcast, A Mediocre Time with Tom and Dan, Orlando's best podcast. One of the best, uh, most fun podcasts out there. Took, uh, took me and the queen of the suck, Lindsay, on our first cruise this past week. I'm hoping I wasn't seasick. Hoping I had a great time with those wonderful people and got to enjoy some sunshine and warmth. Uh, also, this is the first podcast I've recorded since uh, I did some shows in Birmingham, uh, Atlanta, Nashville, and Huntsville. So fun. So fun. Uh, thanks for a great time. I mean, some of those shows were fucking magical. So great to meet so many wonderful time suckers. i uh, got a family vacation coming up. Then I'll be back in Florida at the Off the Hook Comedy Club in Naples on Thursday night, March 28th. Then the Miami Improv on Saturday, March 30th. Then I'll be in the uh, Queen of the Suck, Lindsay's hometown, Cleveland, Ohio, the Warsaw of America, April 4th through 6th with another live Ant Hill Kids Suck on, in Cleveland on April 6th. Uh, Lindsay will be there too. Des Moines, Iowa, April 11th. Kansas City on April 12th and 13th at the Improv. Home of Johnny Dare. Back to Nashville at Zanies for Live Ant Hill Kids podcast on the 14th. Dallas on the 26th. Uh, the Texas Theater. Secret, secret Group in Houston on the 27th. San Francisco, Boston, Spokane, Jacksonville, and more coming right around the corner. Uh, ticket info for those dates and more at dancomas.tv. Uh, got some new Danger Brain uh, shirts in the Time Suck store. 
I, I know that we've been out of uh, most, if uh, I think most, most, I was going to say a lot or most maybe of, uh, of the sizes for most of the shirts for a little while now. Sorry about that. Situation has been rectified. Two new Danger Brain, uh, Danger Brain classic designs are now in the store. Two uh, classy Cult of the Curious low-key shirts. Size of small through 5X. Printed on Bella Tri-Blend cotton. One black, one gray. Uh, uh, black print, or uh, sorry, they're, they're black shirts. One is red print, one is gray. Both printed on a triple blend of 100% imported koala anus. 100% domestic chinchilla labia. And one full pint of Ormus. Orbitally rearranged monoatomic elements brewed during a full moon and infused with positive intentions for maximum power. Manifest, levitate, masturbate in this soft, silky beauty. So check that shit out. Uh, store looks so good. Thanks to Axis for always working to make it better. So great to meet Logan and Kate from Na- uh, Axis in Nashville. Now let's get into a whopper of a tale. Casey Anthony is a strange, strange bird. Uh, even if you think she's innocent somehow, I don't know how you, how you could think that after hearing about this stuff. You got to admit, she's so fucking weird. Uh, so strange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's get to it. Today's suck was built for a timeline. Lays out very, very chronologically. So let's hop into a big old series of so much crazy shit happened year after year, day after day, uh, you know, night after night, right after a word from today's sponsor. Uh, today's time suck is brought to you by Ozzy Confidential. What does punk rock have to do with steroid abuse? How does a, how does a soap company save a suicide? Ozzy Confidential, the newest podcast from Ozzy, tells all. Host Eugene S. Robinson, journalist, actor, stuntman, frontman, creator of Sex with Eugene, True Stories, and Eugenius. I love that name so much, Eugenius. Fantastic. Eugene S. Robinson is now all up in your ear with interviews from the underground. Ungoogleable, untold, undiscovered until now. Part rant terrific crosstalk from the edge, part no holds barred, delving into the dark stuff that's often left unsaid. Complete with a soundtrack to die for, Ozzy Confidential is a podcast for people, personalities, and weirdly wild notions about what we reveal and what we most want to conceal. Episodes can be 20 minutes or two hours long. You never know. Whatever the topic demands. On Ozzy Confidential, the form fits the function. So listen up. For Aussie Confidential, available everywhere audio lives. And if you just can't wait, listen a day early on Him- Himalaya. Download the Himalaya app and get to Aussie Confidential a day early. This is the podcast your mother warned you about. Only from Aussie. Live curiously. Now it is timeline time. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. Casey Anthony's parents, George Anthony and Cindy Placia, met in Niles, Ohio sometime in the late 70s. Cindy worked as a nurse and George was a police officer. Uh, Niles is a small city of about 20,000 people, just over 10 miles northwest of Murder Town, USA, a.k.a. Youngstown, Ohio. Niles is mostly famous as being the birthplace of the 25th president of the United States, William McKinley, born there in 1843. So, you know, Niles is mostly just not known because uh, most people don't care about President McKinley. I, I constantly forget he even was a president. Uh, McKinley, mostly known for being assassinated six months into his second term by one Leon Cholgash, a second-generation Polish anarchist-slash-lunatic. Uh, did you know that Polish people are ten times more likely to be assassins than any other type of person? Uh, I actually just read that, a study that I just wrote. Uh, George and Cindy fell in love. They got married. Uh, they had sex often enough to get pregnant. The couple's first child, Lee Anthony, was born November 20th, 1982. In 1985, Cindy convinced George to leave his job after 10 years as a deputy in the Trumbull County Sheriff's Office and go to work with his father, who owned Anthony's Auto Sales and Service. On March 19th, 1986, George and Cindy had their second child, Casey Marie Anthony, who shared her mother's middle, uh, middle name and initials, CMA. Shortly after Casey's birth, things soured for George at his new job. George would later say that he went to work for his dad with the understanding that he was to take over the family business. But that didn't happen. Instead, his dad fired him. In fact, his father fired him after the two got into a physical fight at work. According to multiple sources, the two men were arguing at the dealership one day when Lee shoved George. Then George pushed his father back with enough force to uh, crash the older man through a plate glass window. Uh, And then he got cut up, had to go to the hospital. Being fired by his father after trying to satisfy Cindy by leaving his police work behind... Uh, reportedly sent George into an intense depression. 
According to Cindy's brother, uh, brother Rick, George tried to kill himself after losing his job, saying he took a whole bottle of aspirin, had to have his stomach pumped out. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough day. Uh, when you get fired from the job you left your previous career for, and the person who fires you is your dad, uh, who, who you pushed through window. Now you can't even ask the person you traditionally asked to borrow money from when times are tough, right? That's awkward. Dad, dad, can I please borrow some money? I just, I got, listen, things have been really rough lately. I just got fired from work. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know, dumb shit. I fired you. Now get the fuck out of my house. Uh, 1987, George took out a second mortgage on the family home to finance his own car business. That'll teach dad. Right? You don't want to bring me back to my car business? I'll, I'll, I'll form my own. He opened up a used car lot called George Anthony's Auto Sales, all right, during 1970. So no one would think it was Anthony's Auto Sales place. It's, nah, this is George Anthony's, okay? This is the good Anthony, the better Anthony Auto Place. I love that. He tries to compete against Dad, uh, and it doesn't go well. What an ego slap. Uh, 1989, George's dealership has gone out of business. And then George loses the family home as well. Uh, still doesn't get rehired or helped out by Dad, who is still running a successful car dealership in the same town that's so that's so uncomfortable dad dad please can i please borrow some money i just listen i just lost the home i just lost the car dealership yeah of course you lost it you were really bad at selling cars that's part of why i fired you because you're fucking terrible you're now get out of my house uh the financial roller coaster for the anthony's would continue throughout casey's life uh cindy's parents had moved to mount dora florida less than 30 miles northeast of orlando shortly before the anthony's lost their home and cindy talked george into moving near her parents she got hired as a nurse by an orthopedic surgeon, and away they went. They managed to buy another home by assuming a high-interest loan held by the uh, family that had been living at 4937 Hope Spring Drive. Hope Spring Drive. Irony of ironies. No hope would spring from uh, this drive. Uh, no hope would spring from this home for the Anthony family. Cindy and George closed on the place for $90,000 on October 4th, 1989. Uh, Casey was three and a half years old. Her brother, Lee, was almost seven. The two kids soon made friends in the neighborhood, started living a pretty normal childhood. Unless you believe what Casey would later say about her childhood during her defense, during her trial. And based on a troubling pattern of behavior that you will soon see includes a preposterous amount of lies, many of them documented by law enforcement. Some of those uh, lies she was found guilty and charged with crimes for. I do not believe anything that Casey Anthony says. I have never read about another person who, who doesn't have like a blatant documented mental illness who lies more often and more consistently and more outrageously than Casey Anthony. It's fucking crazy. It made this suck extremely interesting to research. Uh, George initially uh, got a job at the Orlando Sentinel as a, as a paper route manager, supervising the drivers who made home deliveries of the paper. Uh, with both parents working, Lee and Casey spent a lot of time together, formed a close bond. George would intermittently be employed throughout Ch Casey's childhood. Her mother, Cindy, would work consistently. In uh, grade school and junior high, Casey was, by all accounts, a, a pretty normal kid and a good student. She got good grades, uh, didn't exhibit any prob uh, behavioral problems at school. She was active in a, a few different sports. She won like a citizenship award. Uh, she had plenty of friends. She developed a close uh, friendship with a neighbor girl named Jessica Kelly. At Liberty Middle School in Orlando, Jessica introduced Casey to someone who just moved to Hope Spring uh, Drive, Keo Marie Torres. The three girls became close friends. Uh, she remained friends with them for years. Uh, Casey formed another friendship that would last for years in middle school with uh, Melina Calabrese. Or Calabrese. Uh, they met in uh, seventh grade when they were uh, in the same class for English and math. They were both boy crazy. Casey, by the way, gets real, real boy crazy in a few years, like like real boy crazy. Um, I'd say hail Lucifina, but Lucifina wants nothing to do with Casey Anthony. Uh, she doesn't care for her, and honestly, I think she might feel kind of threatened by her. Casey Anthony is, is definitely a, a she-devil of, of a different sort. Uh, when Casey's in junior high, George injures his knee, loses his job at the Orlando Sentinel. After rehabbing from his accident, he lands a service position at a pest control company. And then one day as George heads into a customer's house, he trips over a curb, lands on his bad knee. He can now barely walk. And once again, he's out of a job. And I feel like there's more to these firings than just a little bit of knee trouble. Like if, if he would have been an awesome, valued employee, I feel like he keeps his job. Just my opinion. Uh, and this is just based on George coming across it. It's, it's quite the consistent fuck up in a lot of this tale. Um, according to what he told his family, uh, uh, George gets bored rehabbing his knee. He's home alone for days at a time with the help of a credit card he has obtained without his wife Cindy's knowledge. He starts gambling online. And then he gets another credit card and another and another, maxing out each line of credit in order to kick so much fucking ass gambling. He, he turns $20,000 worth of credit into just under half a million dollars in cash 
gambling online like people often do. I cannot recommend online gambling enough. If you're having any kind of money problems, if you're having any kind of relationship problems, get online and get to gambling. It, it is the safest, fastest, most effective way to make a lot of money. It's mind boggling to me how many people choose to have jobs and work when they could easily just be fucking crushing it on online casinos. Uh, of course, that's not true. Uh, that, that tale never works out that way. No, George puts his family tens of thousands of dollars in debt instead of just rehabbing his knee and getting a fucking job like a regular person. Uh, Lindsay and I actually joked that if we had to pick between one uh, of the other, or the other, excuse me, we would rather be cheated on physically instead of fiscally, truly. I- I'd be able to forgive Lindsay more easily for a random one-night stand than I would than I would if she just pissed away our financial future behind my back. Like, fuck that. That, to me, is more devastating of a betrayal. Like, you, you, you can sometimes work through, uh, through uh, adultery with some therapy. You can't therapy your way back into restoring your old 401k balance. Uh, the secret life that George leads here is important to mention because a short time later, Casey will begin to lead her own secret life. And uh, I just wondered, like, did she, did she learn from dad's example? Did she rationalize that it was okay to lie and hide parts of her life and make shit up, you know, to not get in trouble because that's what dad would do? In the fall of 2000, Casey and her circle of friends entered Colonial High School. They remained friends for all four years. Casey appears to have, have had a healthy high school social life as well. Class, classmates remember her being involved, showing up at school events, going to the mall, going to parties. Uh, her friend uh, uh, Melina would later say that they had fun, but we never did anything crazy. Unlike a lot of her high school classmates, Casey was very adamantly against cigarettes and pot, uh, Melina would say. Around that time that Casey starts high school, Cindy finds out about George's gambling. Uh, they somehow work through it. Uh, also in 2000, Casey's older brother Lee graduates from high school, gets a job managing a group of storage units. When that business is sold to another company, he gets an even better job working with computers for a business that offers uh, parking lot services for big events like the Super Bowl. Lee uh, starts making good money for a young man without a college education and even gets free Super Bowl tickets. He hires his dad, George, and then has to fire George when they get into an argument at work that, lead, that gets physical and then George pushes his son Lee through a window. Now, it's hard to say if, if George just likes to push family members or people named Lee or bosses. It's because all, it's all the same there. So uh, that didn't happen. But uh, that would have been a great addition to the story, though. But this, this, this story actually, actually needs no additional insane details. Casey is going to provide uh, plenty starting right about now. In the spring of 2004, Casey Anthony is supposed to graduate from high school. And it's right before her graduation that her troubling pattern of keeping secrets and lying all the fucking time emerges. About a week before her graduation ceremony, Casey's mom, Cindy, asks Casey where her cap and gown are. And Casey just shrugs and says... They haven't given it to me yet. Then just three days before graduation, George and Cindy learn for the first time that Casey is having some problems at school. Her counselor calls, asks Casey's parents to come in for a meeting. The principal tells them that at this meeting, Casey will not be graduating. Uh, They're told that Casey had been offered, quote, several options to get the required credits to graduate, but that she didn't take advantage of any of them. Casey hadn't shown up for various classes numerous times throughout her senior year and essentially just flunked out of school. Now, her grandparents have come into town They've already come into town to watch from Ohio to watch her walk down the aisle, right? Uh, to what to go to her graduation party, which she won't be happy. Like how fucking awkward. George and Cindy have no idea. George demands to see Casey's school records, but the administrators refuse because she's 18. Their hands are tied, you know, legally. And then Casey, for whatever reason, refuses to get those records to give to her father. This is the first incident of such a, a terrible pattern of enabling that will emerge in this family. Casey will do something super fucked up. And her parents will just continue to support her and and fix the problems. This tale is such a great example of how you should never do that. Don't enable your kids. Uh, When you just keep fixing someone's problems for them, they never learn how to fix shit for themselves. And uh, and even worse, they can, you know, learn that causing problems, it's just not a big deal. Right? Someone's going to pick up the mess. So why even bother not to cause problems? Who cares? You know, and, and also, how weird is it that Casey just blew off taking the classes that she needed to graduate high school with? And just didn't realize, like, she wouldn't be graduating until, like, a week before. Like, did she, did she think they would just give her a cap and gown anyway? Like, I feel like you're pretty super aware of what you need to do to graduate school. I mean, I was, you know, I, I knew I had to, you know, show up for class and get certain grades and, you know, pass them. I had to pass them. It's a pretty straightforward system. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. No part of me understands how you just fucking don't get that. How you just, like, not show up for class and then show up to graduate and be like, hey, where's my, where's my shit? Where's my diploma? You didn't go to you didn't go to school. Well, I did for most of the years. Just give it to me. Um, 
And how did Casey's parents not know until the last second that their daughter wasn't going to graduate high school? How did they have no idea? It, I, Lindsay and I check in with Kyler Monroe about their grades several times a semester, every single semester, and will do so, continue to do so until they're living on their own. And then when they're in college, if, I, if I'm helping to pay for their education, I'm going to still be checking in every semester because I'm not, I'm not paying for D's and F's. Right? You want to flunk out of school? All right, you fucking do it on your dime. I'd rather, I'd rather literally burn my money in the backyard than pay for somebody else's party and bullshit. You know, at least then I get to feel the warmth of the fire. So clearly, George and Cindy not keeping real close tabs on Casey not super involved parents, and they will continue not to keep close tabs on her, uh, as you'll see, and continue to enable her. Uh, Casey will later say she'd been, she'd been keeping bigger secrets than, than not being ready to graduate high school for years. She will later claim in court that at the age of eight, her father, George, started to sexually abuse her. She will also uh, say, th- uh, she will say that her dad molested her and raped her often between the ages of eight and 11, intermittently after that, uh, vaginally and orally until she turned 18, she will also claim that her brother molested her throughout her childhood, doing stuff like sneaking in her room in the middle of the night and fondling her breasts. Uh, she said she told her mom about this and that her mom, Cindy, didn't do anything. And I don't fucking believe it. I know you don't want to take these kind of ac- accusations lightly, but you know I certainly wasn't there. However, you are about to hear a tale of so much deceit coming from none other than Casey Anthony. It will make these claims extremely hard to believe. Uh, she lies whenever it helps her. She doesn't care who the lies hurt. Uh, she doesn't care how ridiculous the lies are. Oh, my God. Um, yeah. The more I researched Casey Anthony this past week, the more I just, I don't like her. Really don't like her. Really horrible to be molested by your father and brother. Also very horrible to make up false claims of sexual abuse at the hands of your father and your brother. That's another kind of monster that does that. Uh, I am curious what opinions you all come uh, to about her. In, in the 2018 docuseries, Casey Anthony, her friends speak, a former friend, Jonathan Daly, calls Casey a pathological liar. He says, a lot of times she would lie about very innocuous things, that it didn't matter if you lied or not. You could just tell the truth and it wouldn't change any kind of outcome or what people thought about you. And then he added, from the day I met her till the last time I ever spoke to her, that was just kind of part of her personality. And he, Yeah, no, he nails it. Another man named Roy Clint House, who was the roommate of Casey's boyfriend, Tony Lazaro, at the time her daughter Kaylee would disappear, would say, Everything that Casey Anthony had been saying to us was a complete lie. I don't think there is anything that the world or the media got wrong about Casey. I do believe the justice system got it wrong. Basically, everyone who is not part of Casey Anthony's uh, future legal defense team feels that she is a terrible person and a liar. And and I'm going to lay out a lot of examples of why they feel this way. Uh, So let's get back to 2004. Cindy and George had not given up on their daughter despite the graduation situation. They offered to provide the money for any educational expense she may need to get her diploma she chooses not to pursue that. Uh, Casey wants a career in photography, so they find a number of photography scholarship opportunities. She doesn't pursue that either. She does get a job with Kodak. Uh, the company had a Universal Studios theme park contract, and Casey gets a job snapping photos of people enjoying the rides. Uh, her, her manager, Mike Kozak, thought highly of her. Funny name for that job, by the way. Hi, I'm Mike uh, Kozak. I work at Kodak. Uh, sorry, what? Um, Casey went into the manager trainee program where Mike taught her the ropes. He said that he, uh, he felt she had a pleasant personality, got along with the crew. Uh, looks for a moment like her graduation mishap might have just been a temporary lapse in judgment. Now she's back on track for a nice life. Uh, not, not, not so fast. Um, in October of 2004, Casey reconnects with her old friend, Keo Marie, uh, when she also gets employed by Universal Studios. Casey and Keo Marie uh, worked together on Halloween Horror Nights at the park leading up to Halloween. Uh, Keo Marie would later tell interviewers that she felt like something w- was different about uh, Casey. Felt like something to change in the past few months uh, to the point that she actually suggested uh, Casey get professional help. She doesn't go into details why at that time, but clearly she thought something was wrong. In the first week of January 2005, Casey meets 19-year-old Jesse Grund at uh, Universal. Uh, Jesse, the poor bastard who will be strung along and manipulated by Casey for years, also uh, works at the park. Casey and Jesse begin dating or at least hooking up on a regular basis by the end of the month. Uh, He likes her sarcastic sense of humor. She says... uh, He's a lot of fun to be around. But then just two weeks into the relationship, Casey says, I'm in love with you. And Jesse freaks out and breaks up with her. Casey, however, doesn't go away. Uh, She helps Jesse's brother get a job at Kodak and and starts coming around uh, or continuing to come around the Grund house to see Jesse, even though they've broken up. So uh, stalker alert. That's weird uh, behavior, in my opinion. June of 2005, Jesse's father, an ordained Pentecostal holiness church minister, Reverend Richard Grund, 
catches sight of Casey for the first time. Another odd name. Pastor Richard Grund. Very close to Pastor Dick Grund. Very close to Pastor Dick Grundle. Uh, the Grundle, of course, being the area between the anus and scrotum in a, in, in a male. Or the area between the anus and the vulva in a woman. Reverend Taint. Uh, too bad he's not, also not a doctor. Anyway, Pastor Dick Grundle. Noticed right away that something, uh, uh, so he noticed right away something that everyone else had somehow missed. This is insane. He notices that Casey is very pregnant. Uh, Jesse tells his dad what Casey had been telling him and everyone else about her bloated belly. Uh, she said she was just having female problems. No, no, it turns out she's about six months pregnant at this point. And, 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 she, and she didn't tell anybody she was pregnant. Never talked about being pregnant. Never admitted to be, nothing. Not a word to anyone. So weird. She's not a big lady. 5'2", non-pregnancy weight when she was young, but 105 pounds. Petite, a small, petite woman. You are showing big time when you're six months pregnant, when you're 5'2", and 105 pounds. Uh, and what's crazy is that Casey's parents, she's still living with, they also have no idea that she's pregnant. How the fuck does that even happen? How did Casey never think to take a pregnancy test? How did her parents never think to ask her to take a pregnancy test? She finally admits she's pregnant sometime around the end of June. <laughs> so weird. She pretends everything's fine in high school and it's not. Now she's been pretending everything, uh, or pre been pretending that she's not pregnant when she is. About a month later, July 2005, a month before Casey would give birth, she texts Jesse, I'm pregnant and you're the father. That's it. Uh, Jesse doesn't buy it. After talking to Casey, he realizes that there was a major flaw in her timeline in order for him to be the dad. Based on her due date, she hadn't gotten pregnant the month uh, until, or she got pregnant the month before he'd met her. Casey refused to believe anyone else could be the father. Uh, he told her that even if he was, he wasn't ready to have a kid. They should put the baby up for adoption. She tells him that's not an option. Jesse's family encouraged him to get a DNA test and to not let Casey put his name on the birth certificate until the results come back. Yeah. Pastor Dick Grundle put his foot down. August 9th, 2005, Cindy and George Anthony are with Casey when she goes into the delivery room at Florida Hospital in Winter Park. Kaylee Marie Anthony is born. Healthy baby girl. The moment Casey is out of the delivery room, she calls Jesse. He rushes to her side, uh, holds the newborn in his arms. He tells Cindy, George, and Casey that he will do everything he can for the baby. He accepts that he is the father, except he doesn't actually accept that. When he and Casey are alone, she tells him, I want to put your name on the birth certificate. And he says, no, let's do a paternity test first. Casey's furious, refuses to allow the test to be conducted. Jesse petitions the court, uh, is granted legal authorization, pays 550 bucks, waits eight weeks for the results while he waits, spends as much time as he can with Kaylee in case he is her dad. In mid-October, the results come back, reveal conclusively that Jesse is not the father. Casey refuses to tell her parents who the real father is, but she tells a few friends now that it's some guy named Jesus. This is the first time anyone's heard of Jesus. Uh, did she know that it was the whole time that it wasn't Jesse? Like, is that another lie? Another secret? Uh, is, is Jesus even a real person? Or is this some strange, sarcastic joke? A little play on the word Jesus. She's trying to tell everybody she's, she's having an immaculate conception. Or had one. Uh, late 2005. Shit really is not going well in the Anthony household. You'll excuse me for one second. We're, we're just going to take a quick sip of water. I know that's annoying, but I have a... Uh, Fucking get mad at my virus. Get mad at my cold virus that refuses to uh, stop harassing me. Uh, there's there's a new baby. I should you know it's probably some kind of demon. It's probably a throat demon. Should have uh, should have bought some of Woody's products. Or probably probably Woody has some kind of throat repellent. Maybe maybe Ed Kemper has some kind of throat lozenge based on his his throat thrusting. Uh, two thousand late two thousand five. Yeah, shit's not going well in the Anthony household. There's a new baby living in George and Cindy's house. Uh, George and Cindy. Uh, didn't even know it was a possibility a few months earlier. They don't, even, they don't know who the father is. Casey's broke. It's on them to pay for this baby. Then things look like they're turning around for a second. George receives a check for $60,000. It was a workman compensation settlement for his knee troubles. And what initially looks like great news becomes terrible news. Uh, Cindy thinks they should use the money to refinance their home at a more reasonable percentage rate. Then George confesses that the new money has already been spent. Says he's, uh, he's used it to pay some kind of, uh, uh, says he's used it to pay back some new online gambling debts. $60,000 to pay off some of his debts. What the fuck is going on in this family? Casey's hiding a pregnancy for seven months. George is hiding a massive gambling addiction. Again, how does Cindy have no idea that her daughter's pregnant? Uh, her husband's blowing $10,000 on gambling. It's a weird house of hidden lies. Um, George does the right thing. Throws uh, Or Cindy does the right thing. Excuse me. Throws George the fuck out of the house. First dad fires him. Now his wife fires him. Captain Dumbshit just can't seem to keep himself from ruining stuff. 
moves in with his parents in Fort Myers. I'm sure his dad was beyond happy. And, and yes, I do realize that gambling can be a real addiction. I still don't have to like it, and, and I don't. Get help. Don't fuck your family's future over with your dumb shit. Get rich quick schemes. If it seems too, too good to be true, it usually is. Cindy wipes out her 401k to catch up on car insurance under past bills or past two bills. She thought George had been paying. Uh, she also has to pay a penalty to the IRS because George cashed out his own retirement account and didn't report the income before he blew that on gambling as well. I, I couldn't do it. I, I could not stay married in this situation. Love Lindsay. But if she tells me there's no money in my retirement account because she was feeling lucky on the slots, there will be no more queen of the suck swinging through the suck dungeon. Uh, changing the locks, taking her crown, and I will never join my bank accounts with anyone ever again. And I only feel comfortable saying this because I'm not worried about it. And we have a lot of talks about money, like a lot. It's all out in the open. I will never understand couples who have no talks about like money. Like money doesn't buy happiness, but financial irresponsibility, oh, that, that, that pays for a lot of divorces, a lot of misery. Uh, Cindy consults a divorce attorney who gives her more bad news. Even though she'd made all the house payments, George would still get half of the house in a divorce. And she'd probably have to pay alimony to him <laughs> because she'd been the main financial support for the family since they moved to Florida. Gotta love some of these alimony laws, like rewarding lazy dirtbags for being lazy. There needs to be a, uh, they never put any effort into this marriage and they don't deserve shit kind of clause in, uh, in some divorce laws. Cindy tells her mother, ain't no way he's getting the house I paid for. Even if I sold the house and got an apartment, half the money would go to George. I can't afford a divorce. Between George and Casey, I'm living paycheck to paycheck. Also in the fall of 2005, uh, Casey, after her maternity leave is over, just stops showing up for work. Doesn't quit. Just stops showing up. Uh, she swings through one time to show off her baby and then never shows up again ever. Kodak files paperwork terminating her for job abandonment. Casey also somehow uh, reconnects with Jesse Grund in late 2005. They start dating again. She wants to move in with him, but Jesse is living with his parents. And uh, Reverend Dick Grundle, he's not having that. Not able to live at the Grundle household, uh, uh, Jesse wants to move into Casey's house. Uh, Casey's house. Uh, Cindy's not having that. She's already paying for her life, George's life, Casey's life, and Kaylee's life. She doesn't need somebody else who clearly doesn't have their shit together. Uh, despite neither family <clears throat> being supportive of this relationship, Jesse and Casey get engaged. Makes sense. Numerous uh, uh, guys Casey hooked up with would later comment specifically about her being uh, very wild, very good in bed. I'm guessing Jesse's dick was more in charge of the wedding proposal than he was. In the spring of 2006, George and Cindy go on a few test dates and reconcile. George moves back in, doesn't like Jesse, doesn't approve of uh, Casey and Jesse spending time alone in Casey's room. George and Cindy tell Jesse that he can't spend the night, can't be alone with her laying in her bed, etc. Um, Casey does not like this, but it's, you know, it's not her house. And now shit starts to get extra weird and secretive with Casey. Sometime around April of 2006, Casey calls old high school friend Lauren Gibbs, asks Lauren if she can come over and watch Kaylee while Casey goes to work. Uh, Lauren heads over to Hope Spring Drive, takes care of baby Kaylee until Casey returns home from work. Uh, she never charges Casey for watching Kaylee because she knows life is not easy for a single working mother. Casey uh, um, had told Lauren that she worked at Universal Studios, and that's not true. Here we go again. Casey not employed by anyone at this time. Casey later tells Lauren, sending others, that she's got another job, this time at Sports Authority, another lie. Casey starts going out late at night, leaving the baby with her mother, telling Cindy that she's heading to work to do inventory. Then one day, Lauren is watching Kaylee needs to call Casey when she's supposedly at work at Sports Authority, and the person who answers the phone says, who's Casey Anthony? Casey Anthony doesn't work here. I don't know who that is. Dude, what do you say to Lauren in a situation like that when you show back up if you're Casey Anthony? Oh, wait a minute. Did, <laughs> did I say I was working in sports authority? I meant shorts authority. I got, I, you can see how you can see how I mixed up those two names. Uh, shorts authority is a new place that doesn't have a sign up or a phone yet. It's a place you go to get shorts. Uh, if your company buys, you know, or sells shorts. And uh, we, we sell a lot of shorts in Italy, uh, specifically the Isle of Capri. Uh, we're also an authority on, on Capri pants. So anywho, <laughs> thanks for watching Kaylee. Uh, when Lauren finds out Casey doesn't really work at sports authority, she calls mutual friend uh, Melina Calabrese, tells her about it. Melina tells her to confront Casey, and she does. But Casey won't admit to lying, even when directly confronted. When Lauren asks her, why did you say, why, why, did, why did they say you didn't work there? Casey doesn't have an answer. She blames it all on a communication problem at work. Uh, Lauren doesn't buy it, and their friendship and her free babysitting is over. 
Casey's pattern of secrets, lies, and manipulation continues. In early June, Casey breaks off her engagement with Jesse, tells her friend Melina, uh, who remains friends with Casey despite her constant weird lies, that she'd stop seeing Jesse because he was not Casey's, uh, Kaylee's father. The biological dad she now claims is a dude named Josh. Not Jesus. Josh now. A one-night stand she'd met at Universal Studios. Uh, Melina would later recall asking Casey, is Josh going to be part of Kaylee's life? And Casey reportedly said, no. Josh has a girlfriend he's going to marry. They already have kids together. I'm not even going to tell Kaylee about Josh until she starts asking questions on her own. And then the story changes again. In the summer of 2006, uh, Casey clips out an obitu obituary of a young man named Eric who died in an automobile accident locally, tells her parents that Eric was the biological father of her daughter. And then later she would write a memorial to Jesus, whom she would start to tell other friends was now the father. She's fucking nuts. Uh, it would later be proven that Casey didn't even contact Eric's bereaved parents to let them know they had a granddaughter. She never applied for social, uh, social security benefits that a child would be eligible for when a parent dies. Never has DNA tests done to match Kaylee with Eric. Why? Well, because Eric's not the father. She didn't even fucking know Eric. Uh, I've always been fascinated with pathological liars. Casey Anthony seems to definitely be one of these people. And, and why do people do that? Why do people lie like this? Uh, psychology experts don't even really know. According to some psychology journals I found, uh, the definitions of compulsive and pathological liars are still kind of being figured out. Paul Ekman, PhD, professor uh, emeritus of psychology at the University of California in San Francisco, says that compulsive liars truly do feel compelled to lie. He says they tell the stories they think want to be heard. He says when you ask a compulsive liar for an opinion on an important issue, they're likely to say something like this. You know, you made a really wise choice in asking my opinion. Many people do. I've actually been asked by the governor of California to comment on this. They just take stories to extreme places to make themselves look that much more important. Which is so, why, like, why? Like, I would just never do that. Like, I remember talking about liars um, uh, with, my, with one of my buddies, Eddie Vedder, a while back. Like, it was like, oh, I don't know, over 10 years ago. He found out about my stand-up and asked me to come hang out with Pearl Jam and a couple of festival shows. It was like, it was amazing, but so fun. You know, I fixed a few songs he was writing on, and it was just nice to do that again because I'd written a few of the songs from the early albums. But, uh... Like when I was in high school, and I just, you know, I kind of sent them in. I did the same thing for Metallica. But anyway, um, Eddie and I were talking about liars. And we just agreed that compulsive liars do feel compelled to lie and just to tell big, bold lies like no one would believe. Like, why would you even try and get away with that? And I asked Elon Musk about that, you know, what he think. And, and he could, he invited, you know, he was like there too because, you know, he's a, he's a huge Pearl Jam fan. And so when I found that, I like to connect the two. And I met uh, E, as I like to call him. Uh, when I helped design some of the first Teslas and, you know, talk about colonizing Mars. But that's neither here nor there. The only person I've met who doesn't think compulsive liars actually need to lie is Halle Berry. But I have a hard time trusting her opinion because she won't even admit that we were engaged for six months before I dumped her when I met you, Lindsay, you know. So it doesn't make me mad, you know. It doesn't make me mad. Uh, liars piss off Jay-Z and Beyonce. I was talking to them about that. I put, I put them on the mic, but they, they just left to run some errands for me for a few minutes, you know, because I got I to gotta get the hovercraft, uh, you know, tuned up right after the show here. So... I hope you know none of that was true. But some people really say shit like that or almost as crazy as that and then they act like it's true. And Casey Anthony is one of these people. Uh, Dr. Ekman thinks that pathological liars are even bolder than compulsive liars. He says they continue to lie when they know that you know they're lying. <laughs> uh, he also says that neither compulsive nor pathological lying has been studied extensively. Experts don't know for sure what drives the lies. So we may never know why can Casey Anthony lies, but it does seem pathological. Uh, we do know that she lies a lot. Even when it's, you would think it's so obvious that everybody knows that she lies. And, uh, and often, so, so many more lies to come. And let, let, let's get back into those lies. After a word from our, <clears throat> excuse me, after a word now from our final sponsor, uh, Time Suck is brought to you again by Woody's Spirit Supplies and more Spectral Emporium. Hi, everybody. This is Woody. And excuse me, I'm a bit of a cold today as well. Your favorite paranormal puppet. And well, <laughs> I'd like to offer a formal apology today. Excuse me, let me, okay, let me grab this here. I, Woody Geraldine Lancaster III, hereby sincerely and formally apologize to one Charles Benjamin Gutman for defamatory remarks and abusive treatment over the past several months. I acknowledge that it was both morally and legally wrong uh, to, to, for my associate and handler to put him in a naughty boy cage for terrible product ideas or any other reason. And I also acknowledge that at work drinking uh, is unacceptable. And I also realize that I shouldn't snort cocaine at work or bang marionettes 
or take my penis out and ask Mr. Government to hold on to Woody's Woody and feel it grow when I tell lies like Mr. Government is handsome or Charles is very smart or I never had sex with Charles's wife. I understand now that that is in fact abusive. From this day forward, I also give uh, agree to split sales revenue evenly with Mr. Gutman instead of taking the, the 90% that I was taking. <laughs> Speaking of revenue, please head on over to Woody Spirit Supplies and More Spectral Emporium.com to get 50% off your order of new and improved paranormal rape repellent that now doubles as insect repellent for ombre sino ants. Whee! Wow! That is not today's sponsor. That was tricky to do. That was tricky to do today. Time, uh, today's time suck is brought to you by The Great Courses Plus. Uh, so hip, hip, hooray. I know you time suckers take a lot of joy in learning as much as you can about the world. Me too. Uh, that's why I want to keep asking you to check out The Great Courses Plus. And I know many of you have already done so and are loving it. Uh, this online service gives you unlimited access to thousands of video and audio lectures. Learn about virtually anything from fascinating, engaging experts who are passionate about their subjects History, science, psychology, literature, martial arts, and more. I'm looking forward to checking out one of their new courses that seems like it's built for me. Effective Research Methods for Any Project. Amanda M. Rosen, PhD, Associate Professor of International Relations, Head of Global Programs, teaches you how to research correctly and effectively. Lecture number two is titled Characteristics of Good Research. Take a thorough look at what distinguishes sound research from unsound research. Study important criteria for good research, useful both uh, for evaluating the research of others and for structuring our own, noting how good research is systematic, objective, empirical, cumulative, and transparent. Also learn in detail how to spot poor research and about potential pitfalls for researchers. Uh, so yeah, yeah, one of the many, many new series on The Great Courses Plus, so much knowledge all in one place. I want you to start enjoying The Great Courses Plus with this exclusive limited time offer. Get two months of unlimited learning for just 99 cents. That's uh, total access to enjoy their huge library of engaging lectures for two full months for under a dollar. Uh, but to get this exclusive offer, you must sign up within the next few weeks at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash timesuck. Uh, the special offer to get two uh, full months for just 99 cents is only available for a limited time only at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash timesuck. Sign up now at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash timesuck. Link in the product description. All right, and I'm going to take a quick sip of water again and hope that my fucking voice doesn't completely fall apart for this episode. It's the summer of 2006. 20-year-old Casey Anthony is telling everybody different stories about who the father of her, about to turn one-year-old daughter Kaylee Marie Anthony is, the daughter whose pregnancy no one seemed to really know about until Casey was seven months pregnant. Casey's now having a hard time finding a new babysitter because she lied to her last one about having a job. She's lied to multiple friends about multiple jobs. She turns to the guy who she just broke off an engagement with, Jesse Grund. This is a guy she uh, tried to convince was the father of Kaylee until the results of the paternity test proved otherwise. Explains to Jesse that she'd just lost her sitter, needs to find someone new to take care of Kaylee so she can go back to work. Jesse only had a, a one day a week off from his job at Progressive Insurance, but he gives up that day to take care of Kaylee. He missed a little girl. I'm guessing he missed sex with Kaylee, or with <laughs> God, with Casey. A very different turn there. Um, he was supposed to, it was supposed to be a temporary arrangement, but it continued for months. And then Casey talked to Deborah Grund, Jesse's mother, wife of a Dick Grundle, to watch Kaylee two additional days of the week. Deborah had grown fond of Kaylee as well when she initially thought Kaylee might be her granddaughter. Um, she now has this family watching her kid three days a week for free while she goes out and parties instead of actually working like she's telling everybody. It's unreal how fucking manip manipulative she is. Finally, Pastor Dick Grundle gets tired of Casey taking advantage of his son and wife's kindness, tells Casey to find a different babysitting arrangement. And then one uh, summer day, Casey tells the Grundles that she, that she has found new help. She says she found a woman named Zenaida Gonzalez to watch her, uh, to watch Kaylee. This is a lady who she says watches her friend Jeffrey Hopkins' son, Zachary, and that Zachary and Kaylee play together. And this is all a lie. Casey's friend Jeffrey doesn't know uh, Zenaida Gonzalez, doesn't have a kid, right? She doesn't know someone named Zenaida Gonzalez. Casey had heard the name, as we'll find out later, but she didn't know her, let alone hire her. How would she pay for a nanny? She doesn't make any money. Why would she need a nanny? She doesn't have a fucking job. She's too busy partying. She just, she's 20 years old, attractive, very sexual, living in Orlando, Florida, wants her life to be one long spring break party that somebody else pays for. And she is partying hard. Uh, October of 2006, she goes to a masquerade party dressed as a casino waitress in a form-fitting little skimpy black lace, red ribbon costume, has a long makeout session with a woman wearing an umpire's uniform in the middle of the party. 
These are pictures that would show up online later. Uh, then a third woman joined in. All three uh, women made out, grabbed each other's breasts, fondled each other, grinded on one another, did the cheering of the partygoers. Then she starts rubbing up on some dude's crotch in front of other partygoers. It's like a Girls Gone Wild video. No judgment about it. It's just an example of what she's up to, about what Katie, Casey is really doing when she's telling people she's working, when she's getting them to watch Kaylee. This is not an isolated incident. This is typical Casey Anthony behavior at this time. Also in October of 2006, one of Casey's high school friends, Annie Downing, moved into Sawgrass Apartments, or into the Sawgrass Apartments, at 2867 South Conway Road, unit number 218. By the end of the year, Casey would drop by this place nearly every day. Casey would remember this address well, and it would become a major part of her story about how her daughter would disappear the following year. In January of 2007, Casey's maternal grandfather has a stroke and is placed in a nursing home. Uh, Cindy, Casey, and Kaylee visit the nursing home often for a little, little while, and then after a few months, Casey's up showing up. She's over it. She's not going to let Grandpa's stroke fuck up some party. The only stroke she's interested in right now is the stroke of a clean wean at some party. Uh, Casey also tells her brother Lee that she's pregnant again, this time with some dude named uh, Brandon Snow. Uh, she's, she's a 20-year-old shit show right now. Lee tells their mom, Cindy, who understandably is furious. She's already taken care of Kaylee. Now she's going to have to take care of another grandkid on top of paying for her deadbeat daughter, on top of paying for her perpetual fuck-up of a husband. Uh, in February, Casey gets her mom to calm down about the pregnancy she probably doesn't have by claiming that she had a miscarriage on Valentine's Day when she probably didn't have that. Her friend Annie, along with numerous other friends, doubt that she was ever pregnant a second time. Annie also remembers Cindy yelling at Casey all the time, uh, being frustrated that she wasn't staying home, taking care of her daughter. Uh, in March, Casey dates a man named Christopher Stutz, a guy she'd met a few months after Kaylee's birth. They've been friends for a little more than a year, and this relationship doesn't last long. Uh, they like to go watch movies together. Chris would later recall Casey getting texts from her mother all the time saying she needed to come home and watch Kaylee. Kaylee is getting in the way of mom's partying. After they stopped dating, Casey uh, randomly tells him that a manager from Universal had come by Sports Authority, the place where she still wasn't actually working, but a place where she was telling people she was still working at. Said uh, they wanted her to come back to work at the theme park. Said she'd gotten a job in event, event planning. Said it was only temporary uh, because what she really wanted to do was work as a personal trainer. N none of this is true, uh, other than maybe wanting to be a trainer. That, who knows? Casey all, uh, all, um, also seems to be getting super stressed out around this time. I don't know, maybe it's, maybe it's hard to keep all of her lies straight. She shows up at her friend Annie's uh, job for lunch one day, saying that she needed to talk. I need to get away, she says. I feel like I'm having a breakdown. Casey would tell Annie why she felt this way, or would not, excuse me. But she added, I wanted, I want to go to an institution. Kaylee can stay with my mom. I need help. Michelle Murphy, a longtime Anthony family friend, also gets a crisis call from Casey in March. I'm feeling crazy and need someone to talk to. Again, Casey does not explain why she feels this way. She does talk about her miscarriage, that she probably never have. Um, she also expresses fear about her inadequacy as a parent, saying, I don't feel like I'm a very good mother to Kaylee. Uh, that's true. Were these genuine cries for help, or was Casey just trying to get attention? Michelle moves in with Casey's brother, Lee, in May 2007. Sees a lot more of both Casey and Kaylee in the six months she roomed with him. She listened when Kaylee talked about being an event planner with Universal, but thought it was odd, since Casey didn't have the required education one would need to be an event planner. The weird lies continue in June of 2007. Casey was now seeing a man named Steve Jones, but was telling her mother that she was dating Jeff Hopkins. Um, Cindy wanted to meet Casey's boyfriend, Jeff, and his son, Zach, that doesn't exist. Um, she invites Casey to bring them to the house for a cookout. Cindy buys the food, makes preparations. At the last minute, Casey says Jeff can't come. Yeah, Zach's sick. A couple weeks later, Jeff and Zach are supposed to stop by again. It's time for dessert. Once again, no show. Casey said, oops, work called to the last second. They do this a couple more times, a couple more no-show performances. Then Casey announces that Jeff had moved to the Carolinas to live near his mother. If Jeff had known about the stories Casey was telling, he, he would have been <laughs> shocked, again, because he didn't have a kid and never dated Casey. On August 9th, 2007, little Kaylee turns two years old, and her grandma throws her a birthday party at the Anthony home on Hope Spring Drive. Casey's grandmother, Shirley Cousa, goes to the party and uh, gets anthony A few days after the party, Shirley notices that a check is missing from her checkbook. She ends up going to the police when someone tries to cash her check to find out what happened, uh, you know, with her money, who attempted to steal it. An officer tracks down the canceled check in question, has his license number written on the back. He runs the number on the computer and says, Casey Anthony. Ta, take that, old lady. You just got Anthony. Surprise, motherfucker. So you can walk away from your own purse at your own fucking daughter's house. Ha, joke's on you. 
Lucky George didn't grab your credit cards, take you to an online slot machine you know, extravaganza. Yeah, at her daughter's birthday party, Casey Anthony steals one of her grandma's checks. She admits it when Shirley confronts her. Casey apologizes and Shirley accepts her apology, but how shitty is that? The shifty secret behavior continues to mount up. Uh, later in August, Cindy becomes furious with Casey when she gets a credit card bill, finds out that Casey has taken her credit card and bought a bunch of shit for herself online with it. Ha! Take that, Mom! Thought you could let your guard down. While well, Casey's feeling bad for stealing Grandma's check. Ha! Nah, fool, you, you just got Anthony. Casey never feels bad. She just pretends to. Another weird needless August lie. Uh, Casey tells Melina that her daughter's fake father, Josh, has died in an automobile accident. She tells her parents about the car. This is the same, like, she told the same story the year before to her parents, but in that version, it was, you know, Eric. Why does she do this? How does this help her? Does she just do it for attention? Does she just enjoy the act of lying? Uh, November, Casey starts dating Jesse again. What is it? What is this dude's deal? I'm sure Pastor Dick Grundle's thrilled. Uh, Jesse was attending the Orlando Police Academy this time, and one of his fellow trainees was a man named Anthony Ruciano. Casey meets Anthony through Jesse, and by January of 2008, she and Anthony are hooking up behind Jesse's back. Classy moves. So much class. That should be the name of the next Casey Anthony story. Class act. The Casey Anthony story. A tale of a terrific human being. Uh, Anthony would later say that Casey was just using for sex. They'd bang it out, and five minutes later, she'd be out the door. Uh, he'd actually say, you know, that's when you know you kind of feel like the girl. You're like, damn, man, I just got used. Uh, early in 2008, Casey breaks up with Jesse again. Casey also starts hooking up at this time with a dude named Rico Morales. Uh, first hook, hooking up with him at a birthday party on January 23rd. A few weeks later, in early February... Casey sends Rico a note through Yahoo Messenger saying, my life sucks. I can't do anything because of this kid. Uh, she goes on griping about not being able to participate fully with her friends because she's a mother. Oh, boo-hoo. You have an adorable daughter who loves you more than anyone else in the world. You have a family willing to help raise your daughter while you freeload, you fucking piece of shit. <clears throat> By the end of the second week of February, Casey was spending four or five nights a week at Rico's. She'd bring Kaylee most of the time. Uh, she told Rico th that she worked at Universal for the past four years. Talked about her work a lot. This is crazy to me. She'd you know, go on long stories about her boss, Tom, and her friend, Julie, at work, and other people who did not fucking exist. Ah, oh, she's batshit. On St. Patrick's Day, March 17th, just two days before her 22nd birthday, police believe Casey Anthony searched on the home computer chloroform, alcohol, acetone, peroxide, inhalation, and death. Four days later, she believed she did a, they believe she did a little more searching. Uh, went on blogspot.com, druglibrary.org, uh, and also indus, uh, instructables.com. Did searches for shovel, making weapons out of household products, and how to make chloroform. Not suspicious at all. Probably just doing some research for one of her many legitimate jobs. Casey and Rico split up on April 14th. According to him, it was his idea. He'd say it was a fun relationship, but it was getting too serious. No, but I'm sorry, but it wasn't getting serious this time. Casey told her friends that Rico was scared of commitment uh, because uh, the, the relationship was going nowhere. She called it off. They remained friends, but the relationship, <clears throat> excuse me, um, didn't stay platonic. They would have sex off and on until early June. She'd come by and hang out, sometimes with Kaylee, sometimes not. One day when Rick asked uh, where Kaylee was, she said she was with her Zanny. Uh, Zanny, R Rico asked. What does that stand for? Zanita, Casey said. Uh, nope. Kaylee is not being watched by anybody named Zanita. In the spring of 2008, Casey starts getting caught or gets caught stealing money from her family again numerous times. According to what her family would say later, Casey was sneaking cash out of her mother's purse, stealing from her father's coin collection, pillaging her daughter Kaylee's piggy bank, taking from the piggy bank, running up charges on her mother's credit cards, even wiping out her daughter's emergency bank account in early 2008. Everybody's getting anthony that's what you get for leaving your piggy bank unguarded in your bedroom, kid. You get Anthony. If mom won't steal it, grandpa will gamble it away. Uh, actually, grandpa was giving money to Kaylee this time, supposedly. Putting money in an account for He's working again. $30 came out of each paycheck, deposited in Kaylee's name. But when he checked the balance late that spring, there was only $5 in the account. Yeah, you got Anthony too, motherfucker. The student has become the teacher. Uh, George wasn't buying Casey's bullshit job stories anymore. Um, you know, why was she taking, or why was she asking money for money all the time? Why was she stealing from everyone? If she was working, she had no bills. She didn't pay rent. He and Cindy paid for everything that Kaylee needed. I mean, mostly Cindy, but you know, Georgia uh, couldn't get Casey to admit she was lying though. She always had some bullshit story. She claimed her check was locked up in her boss's desk. There was a budget mix up. Her check had been delayed. 
One time to try and prove she was making money, she forged three deposit slips for her mother's account, acting like she just got paid, um, and acting like she was paying her back $4,000, uh, $4,400 actually. She said she'd finally gotten a bunch of back checks from work. So Cindy, thinking there was money in the bank, spent accordingly, and then her house payment bounced. Fucking classic Anthony. Um, what the hell? How did, how did Casey think her mom would not realize the deposits were fake? Like, does she not know how banking works? She's fucking crazy. Like, her brain doesn't work right. She's not good at stealing. She's just really good at refusing to admit that she lies. Oh, man. That spring, uh, Cindy discovers another way that her daughter is stealing from her. Casey had hacked into her mother's checking account to send payments of $300 to $450 per month to AT&T for her cell phone. Again, as if mom wouldn't find out. When Cindy does find out, she demands Casey stop. Cindy is such an enabler. Uh, Casey steals from her time and time again, and her, and her response basically is like, hey, quit doing that. I don't like it. Please stop stealing from me. The next time Casey needs money to pay her cell phone bill, she steals $354 out of an account set up for her grandfather's care after he had that stroke and went to the nursing home. She has no morals whatsoever. Then her grandma, uh, Shirley, catches her again. Shirley emails Casey because she doesn't want to talk to her anymore. Casey writes back, dear grandma, I'm so sorry. I apologize. <laughs> like that clears it up. I'll come down and do some cleaning for you. And Shirley responds, Casey, I don't, want, I don't want you down here. I don't want to see you. And then Shirley calls Cindy and tells her daughter about everything. Cindy demands an answer from Casey. Casey explains that she'd been transferred into a brand new department at Universal, and the budget hasn't gotten through yet. She and all the employees are asked to buy their own telephones. Shirley doesn't buy it. And uh, even if that was true, what kind of person thinks that justifies stealing from your, your grandpa? Shirley would also later claim that she thought Casey had taken a total of roughly $45,000 from her family by that time. And incredibly, none of her friends brought up a drug problem. What kind of person takes all that money other than an addict? Casey seems like a junkie to me, right? You know, maybe, maybe her drug is just not working. Her drug is lying. Her drug is being able to hang out with her friends, go shopping on somebody else's dime, go to the club she wants to go to, not watch her kid, not pay for any of it. Cindy is so stressed out by all this that she goes uh, to see a counselor, later tells the counselor, uh, or later uh, tells people that the counselor said she, was, she should have kicked Casey out of the house. Yeah, but Cindy didn't because she was afraid of losing her relationship with her granddaughter, Kaylee. Uh, her counselor advises her to file for custody for Kaylee because Casey is clearly unfit to be a mother. Cindy also tells her mom, Shirley, around this time that if it wasn't for her job, her parents and Casey, or Kaylee, excuse me, she would, she would kill herself over all the stress caused by Casey and George. Okay, now the first week of May, 2008, Casey reconnects with Anthony, uh, Jesse's colleague, who, who is now a, a deputy with Orange County Sheriff's Office. They text back and forth. She complains about Kaylee and about the job she doesn't have. He talks about wanting to hook up again. She's into it. She also starts seeing Rico again. On May 5th, she tells Jesse, guess where I'm going? Puerto Rico. Rico has family there that we're going to stay with. All we have to do is pay for the flight and some food and expenses while we're down there. Later, when she shares her good news with her mom, Cindy refuses to take care of Kaylee while Casey bounces around in the Caribbean, and Casey's furious. Kaylee has ruined her party vacation. Texts with Anthony continue. Casey complains about Kaylee wanting more lunch one day, and when she uh, says she doesn't uh, know what she wants to eat, Anthony offers to cook for her if she can come over. Casey writes, ha, want me to bring this little snot head over? I don't think so. Then she says, spending the day with Kaylee is 10 times more exhausting than working a 12-hour event. She is not an event planner. In mid-May, Casey's friend Amy needed to find a new place to stay. The house where Amy rented an apartment was sold. Uh, she moved in with her friend Troy Brown on a temporary basis. She was counting on Casey, uh, who had told her that her parents were helping her buy a home to have a new place to stay. Of course, Casey's parents said no such thing. By the time she took up her new living arrangements, Casey told her that the deal that had never existed had now fallen through. Someone else had made an offer on the house. But great news, Casey added, my mom is getting a condo in Winter Park. My grandparents are moving there from Mount Dora since there's a better facility in Winter Park for my granddad. And my mom is signing her house over to me. I'll take over the mortgage payments and we can just move in there. It's great news because I don't actually have to move and Kaylee can stay in the place she's always been. So that's awesome. All of this just exists only in her head. No one has told her none of, that, none of those things are happening. Uh, cool, Amy said. Um, it sure beat her current nomadic existence. She made plans to move into the Hope Spring Drive home in mid-June when Casey told her the paperwork would be completed. What a fucking asshole. Leading people along so she can feel important. <laughs> uh, the third week of May, Casey meets a guy named Tony Lazaro. He was new to town. He scouted around Facebook looking for interesting people in the area. He found a good-looking girl named Casey Marie Anthony who claimed to be a student at Valencia, Valencia 
community college. She wasn't. He sent a friend request, request and she accepted. Soon, um, he had her phone number and called her on May 23rd to tell her about a no-close party that night at the Villages on Science Drive near the University of Central Florida campus, an event where you had to dress in things that weren't normally worn. Uh, she said she'd like to go. She got directions. She wore an American flag toga style to the party. Later that week, Tony asked Casey to come over and hang out uh, with him and another couple. She agreed, but then called that night to say she was staying with the nanny as Kaylee had woken up before she could leave. There is no fucking nanny. In early June, Cindy took a week of vacation. She and George went to visit George's mother in Fort Myers and to relax on the beach. That didn't happen. Cindy ended up babysitting Kaylee the whole week while Casey partied on her mother's dime and told more outrageous lies. You just got anthony Uh, Cindy complained to her mother, Shirley, about it all, saying she was sick of being the only consistent breadwinner in the house. George had bounced around to three different jobs since she'd taken him uh, back. She was paying for Casey's car insurance. She was paying off credit card bills for Casey. When Casey finally showed up on Saturday, June 7th, to pick up her kid, she told Cindy that a babysitter would be keeping Kaylee from June 9th through June 12th because Casey had to take an out-of-town business trip to Universal Studios, or with Universal Studios. Cindy asked Casey about a change of address notice that had showed up for Amy uh, Huizinga, uh, Casey said, oh, she just wanted a package sent there, which makes zero fucking sense. On June 6th, Rico makes dinner for a group of friends. Uh, Casey tells both Rico and Amy that she'd be there. She blows it off, blames her non-existent job. In reality, she was partying at Fusion with that other dude, Tony Lazaro. Rico sees pictures of Casey at the nightclub when he visits MySpace later that day, sends her a text, did you go to Fusion Friday night? Yeah, but my boss sent me there to spy on his daughter, she says. Casey and Kaylee show up at Rico's that night after 8 p.m. Casey claims that she and her daughter had no place to stay. Rico invites him to spend the night at his place. And then uh, Casey and Rico break up because of Casey's party and fusion with Tony. Man, she would have gotten away with so much more if she would have lived pre-social media. That's what's even scarier. Social media fucked up her bullshit game. Yeah, pictures out there documenting lies. The following day on June 7th, Tony teases Casey about the possibility he's going to move back to New York. She bursts into tears chokes back sobs. He tells her, you're taking this way too seriously. Things are going too fast. Relax. You know I'm moving soon. I'm just here for school. Then I'm out. Tony also tells her that if he ever decided to have children, he only wanted sons. He knew how difficult it was to raise little girls because he had two sisters. So basically he tells her, I don't want anything to do with Kaylee. Hello, added murder motive. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Wednesday, June 11th, despite Tony just telling her he has no interest in a daughter, Casey changes her relationship status to list Tony Lazaro as her boyfriend. So dumb. If Lindsay would have told me on our first date that she hates kids, the date would have been over. I mean, well, I may, I, may, I may have tried to sleep with her, but soon after that, it would have been over. Seriously, so fucked up for a single parent to date somebody who doesn't like their kid. So gross. Put the kid first. That's how it's supposed to work. Uh, Tony, Casey, and Kaylee go to the Mall of the Millennia and Casey's car later that day. Casey and Kaylee go shopping. Casey still spending mom's money while Tony promotes some kind of hip-hop showcase on Friday at Fusion. When he finishes handing out his flyers, Tony treats Casey and Kaylee to late lunch, early dinner at the Cheesecake Factory. Casey drops Tony off at his apartment, drives off with Kaylee. And despite seeing Casey a lot after this, Tony would never see that little girl again. During the month of June, Casey was going to Fusion all the time. The night after the Cheesecake Factory, she meets Tony at his place, rides with him to that hip-hop party at Fusion. She sends a mass text message to all of her male friends to promote Tony's showcase. You guys should come. $5 cover. Super hot shot girls. Hot body contest. It's the first time Casey had slept until, uh, throughout the night until the next morning in Tony's bed. She's doing the best uh, job she can to be what he wants her to be. Back home, tensions between Casey and her mom are reaching a new kind of boiling point. A neighbor, Jean Cowdy, uh, was mowing her lawn when Cindy stepped out of her home with Casey on her heels, screaming at her. Cindy responds, but never raises her voice. She gets into her car, drives away. Jean is outside washing her car when she witnesses another unpleasant event. Casey bursts out of her house screaming again. Just shut up, Mom. I don't want to hear it anymore. Cindy said nothing. Just hung her head down as Casey heaped on the abuse. Uh, Casey turned away, headed out for a jog around the neighborhood. On Father's Day, June 15th, Cindy took Kaylee to visit her great-grandpa in the nursing home. Casey ran up to Alex, jumped into his arms. It was the last time he'd ever see her. Cindy and Kaylee uh, took a swim in the pool after returning home. That evening, Cindy finally really confronted about, uh, um, Cindy finally really confronted Casey about her bullshit jobs, slapped down one photo after another, um, that, you know, from the internet that she printed off, 
shots of Casey at no clothes party, uh, shots of Casey, uh, Casey at other parties, at of clubs, tells Casey, you're at work, huh? I watched Kaylee that night so you could go to, or I watched Kaylee at night so you can go to work. Cindy tells Casey she's an unfit mother and she threatens her that she's going to take custody of Kaylee. According to a story Casey's brother Lee shared with a friend later, the confrontation then became physical, escalated to Cindy wrapping her hands around Casey's throat and trying to choke her. Too bad she didn't finish the job. If she did, I bet little Kaylee would still be alive today. The following day on June 16th at 1250 in the afternoon, Casey sits down in a lazy boy recliner next to her dad, tells him, hey, I'm going to be working a little bit late. Kaylee's going to be staying with the nanny. I'll see you and mom tomorrow afternoon. I've already talked to mom. Mom knows I'm going to be staying over. Little Kaylee, such a cute kid, looked extra adorable that day. Dressed in a blue jean skirt, pink top, a pair of white sunglasses. Her hair is pulled back in a perky ponytail. She wears a white knapsack decorated with monkeys on her back. This is the last time George would ever see his granddaughter. Casey and Kaylee uh, pull away from the family home in Cindy's car before 1 p.m. Casey tells her parents that she and Kaylee are going to be spending the night at Kaylee's nanny's house, Zenaida Fernandez, Zanny the nanny. They would return in the next day or two. George leaves for work about 2 p.m. Cell phone records show that Casey was still in the area around the family home until 4 p.m. She tells her parents she's off to this made-up nanny's house, then just hangs around in the neighborhood for a few hours on the day her daughter disappears. Very suspicious. 7 p.m. that evening, cell phone records show that Casey was in the area around the home of her boyfriend, Tony Lazaro. At 7.45 p.m., Casey and Tony, captured on video at Blockbuster, renting a movie, strolling with their arms around each other. There was no sign of Kaylee at the camera, on the camera footage. They actually, they rented two movies. Uh, one movie was called Untraceable, about a kidnapper and a killer. The other movie is called Jumper, features a character who is a mother abandoning her five-year-old child. Very weird. Uh, June 17th, Casey leaves Tony's apartment and goes home about 2 p.m. Kaylee is not with her. She heads back to Tony's around 4 when she calls uh, Cindy and tells her that they're both going to spend the night at Zanny's. So just more lies. They never stop. Casey returns home the next day, June 18th, between 1.30 and 2.30 p.m. The house is empty. She borrows her neighbor's fucking shovel. Just a young woman whose daughter has just disappeared, a daughter she isn't telling anybody who's disappeared, a woman who's never shown any interest in working, a woman who doesn't garden, you know, off to do a little digging. Totally normal. Casey calls Cindy, tells her that she has to attend a work-related conference at Bush Gardens in Tampa. As Casey explains it, she's taken Zanny, Zanny's friend, Juliet Lewis, Juliet's daughter, Annabelle, and Kaylee to Tampa. Annabelle is supposedly Kaylee's age, so it's perfect playmate, tells her mother that the group will be there until Friday, June 20th. Cell phone records show Casey does, in fact, not go to Tampa or Bush Gardens. She spends a day in the area around Tony's apartment on the 19th. The two of them go apartment hunting together. Casey calls Cindy on the 20th to tell her her trip has been extended. Informs Cindy they'll be staying in Tampa another night. Casey calls her friend late in the day, informs her that Kaylee is at the beach in Orlando with Zanny. What Casey was actually doing on the 20th was partying with a bunch of her friends at Fusion. That Friday night, Fusion hosted a hot body contest. Casey spent the evening showing off her body, managing the shot girls. Photos of the event show Casey in pure delight, wearing a short blue dress, high black boots, grinding, dancing with others on the dance floor. Think about the level of sociopath you have to be if you're doing this right after you killed your innocent, beautiful little daughter, which is actually what I think happened. Later, Casey would claim that her daughter's nanny had taken her. What kind of parent goes out and parties it up when they think their daughter has been kidnapped? And Casey tells none of the people she's partying with that her daughter has been taken. Why wouldn't you do that? Who acts like that? A fucking sociopathic murderer. That is quite literally the only explanation for this behavior that makes any sense to me at all. She either killed Kaylee or knows who did and is glad they did it. She's enjoying herself. No one reported her being the least bit upset over anything relating to Kaylee around this time. On June 22nd, Casey calls Cindy, tells her that the conference ended, but she didn't get any time to enjoy the park with everyone, so she's going to stay one more night. What she really wants to do is hang out more with Tony. Casey leaves Tony's apartment at 1.41 p.m. on June 23rd, runs out of gas, calls him for help. Rather than buy gas, she directs him to the Anthony home where Tony broke the lock on her father's shed so that Casey could take two red portable gas cans. They take the gas cans back to her car, pour the contents into the tank, start the car, drive back to Tony's in their separate vehicles. Casey calls Cindy, tells her that on the way home, they were in a minor car accident and that Zanny is injured. They would all stay with her in the hospital. I don't understand any of this. On June 24th, Casey goes to mow the grass and discovers the lock on the shed is broken and that two gas cans are missing. Casey has stolen the cans before, and he suspects her. Casey walks into the house, is shocked George is there. It's the first time anyone in the family has seen her in a week. 
He confronts her about the gas cans. She gets him out of the trunk, shouts at him, storms off. Casey calls Cindy, tells her that Zanny has to stay in the hospital a few more days, says she's staying there too. On the 25th, Casey calls Amy and complains about a smell in the car. She says it is because she ran over a squirrel and it is stuck in the wheel well. No one has seen Kaylee in over a week. Casey has reported her missing to no one. There's a very good chance the smell she's referring to is Kaylee's dead body. On June 27th, Casey leaves Tony's house and phone records put her near the Anthony home. She texts Amy again about how bad the smell in the car is. Her car runs out of gas again at an Amscot store. Casey just abandons, it, abandons the car there. Why would she do this? Maybe because she doesn't want to drive a car that smells like the daughter she's killed. Uh, one with possible evidence of a murder. Three days later, on June 30th, Casey's Pontiac is towed. She doesn't seem to give a shit. She spends the morning shopping with Amy, then drives Tony to the airport in his Jeep. Calls Cindy. Tells her that she and Kaylee are going to stay in a hotel with some dude named Jeff until July 3rd. On July 2nd, Casey calls a tattoo shop, makes an appointment for July 3rd. She eats lunch at Buffalo Wild Wings, shops, and goes out clubbing in the evening. Decides to spend the night at Amy and Ricardo's. When Amy asks where Kaylee is, Kaylee says that she's with Zanny the nanny. Cindy calls Casey eight, nine times, no, I'm sorry, eight times in the 24, 24 minutes between 12, 13 a.m. and 12, 37 a.m., but nobody answers. Again, how guilty does she appear here? Best case, her daughter's been missing for over two weeks, and she doesn't seem to care. Worst case, she's a monster. July 3rd, Casey gets a tattoo, the words Bella Vita, Italian for beautiful life, inked on her left shoulder. Killing your daughter and clubbing in Florida. Is that the beautiful life? I didn't, I didn't know that. Kindy, uh, Cindy gets a hold of Casey on the 3rd. Casey tell, tells her that she and Kaylee, these fucking names, by the way, too. Cindy, Casey, Kaylee. God damn it. I fucking hate it when families do that. Like, like I'm still annoyed uh, in moments with my dad, like, like growing up. Why would you also name me Dan? There's so many other names. Why give me your name? There was, there was, I never considered that with my kids. Anyway, fucking Cindy, Casey, fucking Kaylee. Um, Casey tells her that she and Kaylee are at the Universal Studios for an employee family event. Cindy doesn't buy it, shows up in the parking lot. When Casey um, gets on the phone, informs her that there had been a change of plans. Tells her mom that Jeff Hopkins invited her and Kaylee over to Jacksonville. They're already en route. More crazy lies. Cindy has her son Lee create a MySpace, for, a MySpace page for her so she can post a lengthy paragraph about hurt and betrayal for Casey to discover. Her subject line is, my Kaylee is missing. And she posts her mood as distraught. The 17-line entry is filled with sadness and anger. What does the mother get for giving her daughter all of these chances, a broken heart? Who is now watching out for the little angel? Cindy has to know now in her gut that something horrible has happened to Kaylee. And that her piece of shit daughter has something to do with it. On July 4th, Casey spends the holiday shopping and celebrating, responds to her mother's MySpace post, telling her mom to leave her alone. On July 5th, Tony returns from out of town. Casey picks him up at the airport. Goes back to hanging out with him and his roommates, not caring about her daughter. On July 8th, Casey drives Amy and her ex-boyfriend Rico to the airport in Amy's car. Amy and Ricardo are heading to Puerto Rico. Somehow, Casey manages to get her filthy paws on Amy's wallet and checkbook and within an hour of dropping off her friends at the airport, heads to Target and enjoys a two-hour shopping spree on Amy's dime. Maybe she's jealous that Amy's heading to Puerto Rico instead of her. At 9.48 a.m., surveillance cameras capture Casey entering a local Target where she shops until 11.55 a.m., at which point... She uh, takes her purchases to the checkout counter. Her purchases include the light blue hoodie she'd be wearing she'd be, when she'd be arrested, lingerie, oversized white sunglasses, toilet paper, cherries, orange juice, and a six-pack of Bud Light. Nothing for Kaylee. Nothing for her daughter. That alone, super suspicious. On July 13th, George and Cindy find a notice stuck in the side door of her house stating that a certified letter was waiting for them at the post office. It's a letter informing them that their Pontiac, Sunfire, uh, the car they had let Casey drive, had been towed to Johnson's wrecking service. This, of course, is the car that Casey had left in the parking lot. When Cindy and George go to retrieve the car, a powerful odor hits them before they make it to the car. George would later state, as he approached the Pontiac, he became aware of an unmistakable smell emanating from the trunk. Having previously worked as a cop, George thought he recognized the odor of a decomposing body. Once she gets back home, Cindy calls Casey's best friend, Amy, informs her that Casey is staying with her new boyfriend, Tony, who she met on the internet. Amy agrees to take Cindy to Tony's apartment. Cindy confronts Casey, forces her into the car, finally had enough of all the lies. Kaylee's nowhere to be seen. Casey cannot give a satisfactory answer to Kaylee's whereabouts. Cindy drops off Amy at Amy's house, then makes three 911 calls from her car. Here's the transcript of the first 911 call. Operator, hello. Cindy Anthony. Hi, I drove to the police department here on Pershing, but you guys are closed. I need to bring someone into the police department. Can you tell me where I can? 
the closest one I can come to. Operator, what are you trying to accomplish by bringing them to the station? Cindy, I have a 22-year-old person that has, that has grand theft sitting in my auto with me. So the 22, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, so the 22-year-old person stole something? Yes. Are they a relative? Yes. Where did they steal it from? My car and also my money. Is this your son? Daughter. Okay, so your daughter stole money from your car. No. My car was stolen. We've retrieved it today when we found out where it was at. We've retrieved it. I got that. And I have affidavits from my banking account. I want to bring her in. I want to press charges. Where did all of this happen? Oh, it's been happening. I love that little note. Oh, it's been happening. It's been happening for about five fucking years. And I'm ready to finish the choke job I started a few weeks ago. Operator, I know, but I need to establish the jurisdiction is what I'm trying. Cindy, oh, I live in Orlando. Operator, but what address did these thefts occur at? Well, I guess at my residence. That's actually going to be the jurisdiction of the sheriff's office, ma'am, not the Orlando Police Department. All righty. Let me transfer you over to the communications section for Orange County. Okay. Now, so is this the Orlando Sheriff's Department, the one on 436? Is that open this afternoon or this evening? The substation you're at off Pershing, if it's the Orlando Police, we're open primarily in the day. But that's not the sheriff's. That's the city police, which does not have jurisdiction for your address. I know the Sheriff's Department on 5th. I mean 436. What I'm going to do is transfer you to the sheriff's communication section. You can determine that. Cindy, okay. And then the thing gets transferred. Then you hear like kind of Cindy and uh, um, Casey kind of talking in the background. Cindy says, my next thing will be my child's thing. And we'll have a court order to get it. If that's what you want to play, we'll do that. You'll never hear Casey mumbling. Then Cindy says, well, then you have, no, I'm not giving you another day. I've given you a month. Right. And then it goes on to the second conversation. The second conversation uh, Cindy informs the police that she has not seen her granddaughter in a month and her daughter Casey is lying about what happened to her granddaughter. Then she gets the third conversation. 911, what's your emergency? I called a little bit ago. The sheriff's, uh, the deputy sheriff's not here. I found out my granddaughter's been taken. She's been missing for a month. Her mother finally admitted she's been missing. Okay, what's the address you're calling from? We're talking about a three-year-old little girl. My daughter finally admitted that the babysitter stole her. I need to find her. Your daughter admitted that the baby is where? that the babysitter took her a month ago, that my daughter's been looking for her. I told you my daughter was missing for a month. I just found her today, but I can't find my granddaughter. She just admitted to me that she's been trying to find her herself. There's something wrong. I found my daughter's car today, and it smells like there's been a dead body in the damn car. Okay, what is the three-year-old's name? Kaylee Anthony. Kaylee Anthony? Yes. Is she white, black, or Hispanic? She's white. How long is she? What's a weird one? Oh, I guess because they're looking for it. Never mind. I was like, that's a weird question. Actually, it's a, it's a good question. I'm trying to identify her. Um, how long has she been missing for? I have not seen her since the 7th of June. What is her date of birth? 8, 9, 2000. Oh, God. She's three. She, she's 2005. George, Kaylee's missing. George, what? Kaylee's missing. Casey says Zanita took her for a month, took her a month ago. Dispatch. Okay, I need, I understand. Can you? Can you just calm down for one minute? I need to know what's going on. I'm going to try and dispatch. Is your daughter there? Cindy, I'm on the phone with her. Dispatch, is your daughter there? Yes. Can I speak with her? Do you mind if I speak with her? Thank you. Cindy, I called them two hours ago and they haven't gotten here. Casey finally admitted tonight. It took her a month ago. I've been trying to find her. Ma'am, ma'am, it's the Orange County Sheriff's Department. They want to talk to you. Answer their questions. Casey gets on the phone. Hello? Dispatch, hello? Casey, yes? Dispatch, hi. What can you tell me about what's going on? I'm sorry? Like, what the fuck? Even a response is weird. I'm sorry. They're trying to find your daughter, you fucking horrible monster. Can you tell me a little bit about what's going on? My daughter's been missing for the last 31 days. And do you know who has her? I know who has her. I've tried to contact her. I actually received a phone call today. Now from a number that is no longer in service. Ugh, so weird. I did get to speak to my daughter for about a moment. About a minute. Clearly lying there. Clearly lying there. No, she did not speak to her daughter. Did you guys call and report a vehicle stolen? Yes, my mom did. So the vehicle was stolen too? No, this is my vehicle. What vehicle was stolen? Um, it's a 98 Sunfire. Okay, I have deputies on the way to, uh, to you right now for that. So now your three-year-old daughter is missing. Kaylee Anthony? Yes. White female? Yes. Three years old? 8, 9, 2005, date of birth? Yes. You last saw her a month ago? 31 days. Been 31 days. Who has her? Do you have a name? Her name is Zanita Fernandez Gonzalez. Who is that? Babysitter? She's been my nanny for about a year and a half, almost two years. Why are you calling now? Why didn't you call 31 days ago? Fucking exactly. Why didn't she call 31 days ago? I'll answer that because she fucking killed her daughter. 
because Zenaida is a figment of her fucked up imagination. She's a lunatic. Casey, I've been looking for her. I've gone through other resources to try and find her, which was stupid. Dispatch, can you give me the name of the nanny again? Spell it out. She spells it. Last name, Fernandez. Fernandez hyphen Gonzalez. I think officers are here. Dispatch, the officers are here? Yes. All right. So now the police have arrived at the Anthony house, 10 p.m., July 15th. Cindy is out of, she's out of her mind with just grief and she's distraught. George is calmly stoic. Casey is typically just confused. Like she always just saying weird fucking shit. Doesn't make sense. This is the initial story Casey tells the police. She tells investigators she'd been working at Universal Studios. Lie. That Kaylee had been staying with various friends and nannies. Lie. In particular, a 25-year-old woman named Zenaida Fernandez-Gonzalez. Not true. She tells the detective, and, and by the way, all this stuff would be found out to not be true. It's not just my opinion. She tells the detective that on Monday after Father's Day, sometime between 9 a.m. and 1 p.m., she took her daughter to the apartment of her current babysitter, Zenaida Fernandez-Gonzalez, also known as Zanny. Nope. Lie. She has been introduced to the woman 18 months earlier by her friend Jeffrey Hopkins, who has hired Zanny to babysit his son, Zachary. There is no fucking Zachary. She gave Zanny's address as the Sawgrass Apartments on South Conway Road in Orlando. Casey explained that Zanny and two roommates, Ra uh, Raquel Flora and Jennifer Rosa, shared apartment 210. That is the apartment address I mentioned earlier. The one I said would come back up. Zanny didn't live there. Her old friend, Annie Downing, did. Casey said she had gone to her job at Universal Studios, where she claimed she was an event planner. Also, no, that's not true. She said that at 5 p.m. on June 16th, she drove straight back to the Sawgrass Apartments to pick up her daughter, but no one was home. Cell phone records show that's not true. She tried Zanny's cell phone number, was surprised to learn that the line was out of service. Cell phone records show that that's a lie. Casey said that she spent two hours on the steps to the second floor of the building waiting for Kaylee and Zanny to return. No, she didn't. She said she spent the next few hours going to familiar places in the area looking for Zanny and Kaylee. No, she did not. Said she started out at Jay Blanchard Park, one of Kaylee's favorite spots, moved to other places. After she gave up, she spent the rest of that evening at Tony's. Yeah, watching that fucking movie, watching two movies, having a good time, caught on camera, smiling and having fun. And then every day since the toddler's disappearance, she had gone to malls, parks, banks, any place that she could remember Zanida taking Kaylee. Bullshit. None of her friends would corroborate this search. Zero. She didn't talk about Kaylee being missing to one fucking person in those 31 days. When asked why she had not alerted authorities, she claimed it was out of fear for her daughter's life. She had seen movies and reports on TV in which bad outcomes came when people called the police. She was hoping to handle it on her own. Get the fuck out. It's a ridiculous answer. Casey informs that the, uh, the officer that Zanny had made contact once during the last four weeks. Nope. Nobody named Zanny called her. Cell phone records prove that. She was unable to provide the deputy with the exact date or time of the call. Said it had been disconnected before anything was said. Pfft. Okay, right. Casey said she'd gotten a call from her daughter. Kaylee had started to tell her what she'd been doing. Casey interrupted her, asked her to put an adult on the phone. Child hang up, hung up without telling her how or where she was. There was no way to call her back. The number was blocked. At midnight, a sergeant shows up and, and Casey uh, takes him to Zanny's apartment. When they arrive, doesn't even get out of the car. Just indicates where the unit is on the second floor. Says it's 210. The unit is completely vacant. Who has no interest in going to the apartment that their child has supposedly been taken to? Someone who already knows the kid isn't there, that's who. Someone who knows the kid's fucking dead. They return to the Anthony household. About 4 a.m., Detective Yuri Milich arrives to speak with Casey. Before they began, Milich made it clear this was her one chance to be forthcoming with the truth. He shows her the signed four-page uh, document and says, you're sure that everything contained in these statements is true and accurate? She says, yes. That's the truth, Casey says. It's a story I'm going to stick with. <laughs> story is correct. Casey tells Detective Milich uh, that she has known Zanny since she was pregnant. According to Casey, she had confided in two people about Kaylee's disappearance in the weeks following the event. The two people were Jeff Hopkins and her coworker and her coworker, their coworker, Juliet Lewis. She did not have a phone number for either person. How convenient. Says they were lost when she switched SIM cards. So ridiculous. Uh, Malich asks Casey about her employment. She says she's worked at Universal Studios for about four years. Said that Zanny also worked there part-time as a seasonal employee. Malich then asked Casey if she's had any problem with drugs or Casey uh, Kaylee took any kind of medication. Uh, says no to both. The following morning, Malich goes to the Sawgrass Apartments to inquire for information about Zanny. Meets with the manager, Amanda Macklin, and a maintenance man, Dave Turner. Neither knew Zanida. Neither knew Zanny. Macklin stated that apartment 10 had been vacant for 142 days. Clearly, Casey had dropped Kaylee off, uh, had not dropped Kaylee off there that summer. They then ran Zanida's name to the computer database and did get a hit. A woman named Zanida Gonzalez, who did come to look at the apartment, or actually not that one, but one of the apartments in that complex, 
on April 17th. Never a tenant. But she did complete a guest card, left a cell phone number. Maybe, maybe Casey found that card. By 9 a.m., Malich was at Universal Studios looking for Casey's close personal friends, Jeff and Juliet. Upon arrival, he's informed that Casey is not employed by Universal Studios. Hasn't been for over two years. She did work at the park selling souvenir photos at the souvenir shop, right? Uh, she'd been or selling photos at the souvenir shop. Well, that was, she'd been fired April 24th, 2006. Malich, uh, Malich asked Casey to come meet him at Universal in an attempt to get her to admit to her lie. Casey approaches a security guard, informs him that she had forgotten her ID card. He takes her name, runs to the computer. When he informs her they had no record, she persists, stating emphatically that she did work there. How crazy is this? She doesn't work. The guard requests the name of her supervisor. She dutifully, uh, dutifully provides this name. The three cops then watch this crazy scene unfold, each intrigued to see how Casey's going to uh, react when she when she finds out that like this is all, or when she you know they find out that this is all nonsense. She completely committed to a lie. She had no, there was no chance of being true. Um, to their surprise, Casey, she strides confidently through the maze of office buildings that house the business side of Universal Studios. She takes a left at the first building, walks to the end of the roadway, takes a left again at the next intersection, crosses at the opposite side of the street through a parking lot, passes the first of two. She's just wandering around, enters the door of another building. They know this building has never housed the event planning division where she's claiming she worked. But she, you know, just totally confidently, she just uh, leads them down one hallway after another, winding them around. Finally, she stops, shoves her hands in her back pockets, turns them, flashes some cute little grin, and says, okay, I don't really work here. Like, I, did she think they were just going to fucking give up and be like, all right, sounds legit. I mean, think of the type of person that commits this hard to this insane of a lie. She knows it's a lie. When she's been caught red-handed, she finally admits to it, admits it's a lie. Uh, she's been telling people for two years. My God, man. The detective takes Casey uh, back to the police station to question her. She's still refusing to explain where Kaylee is. Obviously lying. When confronted with her lies, nothing changes. Casey is arrested on charges of child neglect while at the station. She calls her mom. Check out how cold uh, her conversation is in this transcript. Casey says, you don't know what my involvement is in stuff. Her mom says, Casey, mom, what? No. I don't know what your involvement is, sweetheart. You keep, you're not telling me where she's at because I don't fucking know where she's at. Are you kidding me? Casey, don't waste your call screaming and hollering at me. Waste my call sitting in what? Oh, jail? Well, whose fault is it that you're sitting in jail? Are you blaming me that you're sitting in jail? Not my fault, says Casey. Get the fuck out of here. Cindy says, blame yourself for telling lies. What do you mean it's not your fault? What do you mean it's not your fault, sweetheart? Uh, if you'd have told them the truth and not lied about everything, they wouldn't. Casey interrupts. Do me a favor. Just tell me where Tony's number is. I don't want to talk to you right now. Forget it. And then hangs up. Doesn't mention Kaylee one time. Kaylee is supposedly still out there. Doesn't mention her one fucking time. Just wants to know where Tony is. On July 17th, members of the Anthony family appear on TV appealing for the public's help in finding little Kaylee. Detective Melich uh, is able to track down a woman going by the name of Zenaida who lives in Kissimmee, about 30 minutes south of Orlando. She's uh, 42, has six children, drives a car with New York license plates, friendly and cooperative, denies knowing Casey or Kaylee, denies having ever been employed by fucking anyone as a babysitter anywhere. Uh, also on the 17th, a cadaver dog named Jerris is brought into the Anthony home. He picks up the smell of human decomposition in the trunk of the Pontiac Casey was driving. On July 22nd, Judge Strickland sets Casey's bond at $500,000 for felony child neglect. No one has the money, so she remains in jail. On July 23rd and on the 24th, Casey meets with two psychologists. Initial reports from both doctors state that she was perfectly normal, no indication of mental illness. She also stated unequivocally that she had never been physically or sexually abused. The only item of note was an observation made by one of the psychiatrists who reported that Casey was, quote, unusually happy considering her circumstances. That's disturbing. August 26, over two months after Kaylee's disappearance, Equisearch, a Texas-based search group, dispatches more than 4,200 workers and volunteers to look for Kaylee. They find nothing. On August 27th, Dr. Arpad Vass, a forensic researcher at Tennessee's Oak Ridge National Laboratory, is brought in to examine the odor in the trunk of the car. He concludes that it is indeed from human remains. He also finds high levels of chloroform in the trunk of the car. Hair belonging to Kaylee, also found in the trunk of the car. On September 1st, the Orange County Sheriff's Department announces there was a strong possibility that Kaylee is no longer alive. 
On October 14th, a grand jury indicts Casey on capital murder and other charges within two hours of convening. Anthony pleads not guilty. Soon after, Casey sells photos of Kaylee to ABC News for 200 grand. Yeah, uh, December 3rd, the first trial date is set for January 5th, 2009. On December 11th, Roy Cronk, an Orange County meter reader, who'd called the police over the summer about a suspicious bag in a swamp near the Anthony residence, was revisiting the same swamp on Suburban Drive. He noted that a gray laundry bag he'd phoned in to report back, uh, back in August was still there. Now he had no doubt that the, the white object he had seen next to the bag was a skull. Calls his boss, utility company, leading to the fourth phone call to the police, alerting them to something important on Suburban Drive. 9.38 that morning, some of the skeletal remains of a child are found. Over the next few days, they find the torso and most of the ribs uh, had been pulled to a secondary location. The vertebrae had been pulled to a third place. One specific bone, a hip bone, was buried in four inches of muck. The type of accumulation of muck could have occurred only through the movement of water over and around the bone once it had been moved to that location by an animal. Thus, it was determined, like some scavenger. Thus, it was determined that the body had fully decomposed prior to the rainy season in July and tropical, corn, tropical storm Fay, which hit in mid-August. It appears that the body had been wrapped in a baby blanket that had a Winnie the Pooh and Piglet pattern on it and then stuffed in two garbage bags, one inside the other for extra strength, and all of that inside of a laundry bag. About a foot to the left of the skull was a pair of shorts, size 24 months, with kind of a stripe pattern on them. Everything was pretty shredded. When the skull was examined more closely, duct tape was found to be, uh, there was like three partially overlapping pieces of duct tape. It was this brand name of Henkel. During the search, detectives found a number of items that pointed to the remains belonging to Kaylee Anthony. A laundry bag of the same Whitney Design brand was found uh, with Kaylee's remains, uh, like like the, th the same with the remains. There was also one in the Anthony garage. Uh, Whitney Design was a Target product. The canvas bags lined with coated plastic were sold in sets of two, one rectangular, one uh, like a cylinder shape. Kaylee's remains were in the cylinder-shaped uh, bag. A rectangular one was found in the house. Um, venturing back to the house, the search warrant specifically singled out items with Winnie the Pooh and Piglet based on the blanket found on the, around the skeleton, the identical pattern of the two characters with numerous places in Kaylee's room, from her curtains to the bolster on her bed. Cindy would later acknowledge that a blanket that went with the bed set was missing. December 17th, the remains are positively identified as that of Kaylee Marie Anthony. Dr. David Hall, a retired professor from the University of Florida and a renowned expert in forensic botany, was called to the scene to examine the plants growing in the area where the remains were found. What interested Dr. Haskell at the scene was what he didn't find. Had the body been placed in the swamp shortly after death, he would have expected to find evidence of large colonies of early colonizers. Instead, he found evidence of very few, and though there had been both flies and maggots in the trunk, these fell in a separate category from the early colonizers that Haskell expected to find. What could explain this? That Kaylee's body had been in the trunk or some other place for initial decomposition before it was put in the swamp. Late in the evening of January 22nd, Casey's father, George, attempts suicide. Writes a suicide note. Says, I have lived many years. I am satisfied with my decision because I've never been the man you, Lee, Casey, and especially Kaylee Marie deserve. Luckily, uh, uh, paramedics find him before it's too late. On April 13th, the state of Florida announces they plan to seek the death penalty for Casey Anthony on the charge of first-degree murder. A new trial date is set for May 9th, 2011. And let's take a look at that trial after today's Time Suck Timeline. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. Okay, so you already know that Casey Anthony was found not guilty, but, but how? Well, Casey Anthony juror Jennifer Ford said immediately after the trial that she and the other jurors cried and were sick to our stomachs after voting to acquit Casey Anthony of charges that she killed her two-year-old daughter, Kaylee. I did not say she was innocent, said Ford, who had previously only been identified as juror number three. I just said there was not enough evidence. If you cannot prove what the crime was, you cannot determine what the punishment should be. Ford told Moran she thought Casey Anthony's claim that her two-year-old daughter accidentally drowned and that she lied for three years was more believable than the evidence the prosecution presented. Ford said that she couldn't make out logically the prosecution's argument because there were too many unanswered questions about how Kaylee died, including how Casey Anthony would have used chloroform to smother the two-year-old daughter, then put her in the trunk of her car without anyone seeing her. If there was a dead child in the trunk, does that prove how she died? No idea. Still, no idea, Ford told Moran. If you're going to charge someone with murder, 
don't you have to know how they killed someone or why they might have killed someone or have something where, when, why, how? Those are important questions. They were not answered. Get the fuck out of here. A lot of people disagree with this, and, I, and I'm one of them. People like the judge, prosecutor, legal experts. What do you mean? Why? It's fucking obvious why she did it. Kaylee was getting in the way of her party. Essentially, the biggest problem prosecutors faced in this trial was struggling, how to, prove, uh, struggling to prove how Kaylee died. By the time her little body was found, it had been over six months. It had decomposed uh, too much to be able to easily, conclusively identify the cause of death. Russell uh, Hueckler, one of the five alternate jurors who was present for all the testimony and sequestered along with 12 other jurors, said the prosecution failed to prove their case and there was reasonable doubt. Again, they didn't show us how Kaylee died. They didn't show us a motive. Casey Anthony's defense team argued that Kaylee accidentally drowned in the family pool and that George Anthony, Casey Anthony's father, helped dispose of the body. Also in the trial shocking opening statement, defense attorney Joe's, or Jose Baez said that Casey Anthony hit her daughter's death in the same way she hit what the defense claimed was years of sexual abuse by her father and brother. Baez uh, was not allowed to bring up the alleged abuse in closing arguments because Judge Perry didn't believe the abuse had occurred, didn't believe there was enough proof of it. I think the allegations of, of abuse did taint the juror's perception of Casey. She became the victim instead of the aggressor, right? She was the victim of this mean man, these mean men, tiny little pretty Casey, so abused, you know, used to keep secrets. You know, she became so used to keeping secrets, she didn't know it was real, what was fake, including the death of her own daughter. That's why she lied all the time. To me, this just feels like Casey was able to find a defense attorney who was equally manipulative, right? Just as lacking in morals as she was. I don't know how, how certain defense attorneys uh, stomach shit like that. I really don't. I mean, a, a good ability to rationalize, I guess. Maybe an ability to emotionally distance yourself from what the trial is actually about. Turn it into a game where the only object is to win, even if win, winning means letting a terrible child killer uh, walk free. A child killer who stole from her family over and over again, stole from her friends, lied to literally every fucking person she knew, killed her daughter so she could party more often on other people's dime, Right during the trial, threw her own father and brother under the bus to, to ruin their reputations for forever, uh, forever. I think Casey did it, clearly. I think she's a real piece of shit. And since she's free, uh, if you're listening, Casey, I hope you're fucking miserable. I hope you hate yourself for what you've done. I hope it haunts you for the rest of your days. But that's just what I think. That's just one opinion. Let's see what other opinions are out there in today's Idiots of the Internet. Idiots of the Internet. For today's video, I went with the, uh, uh, the reading of her not guilty verdict. There's a video published by ABC News on July 5th, 2011. Most of the commentators seem to feel uh, a lot like I do. The video of her being found not guilty uh, has 28,000 dislikes uh, compared to 2,400 likes. So most people not happy with this verdict. Two years ago, user Patrick M. posts, I'm still shocked no one has murdered her. Yeah, me too. I mean, honestly. I mean, she's still out there just, you know, living it up, partying. Still living in Florida, hasn't changed her name. If Dexter was a real person, she would for sure uh, be dead. User IG Spida337 posts Casey Anthony and Jody Arias would be great friends. <laughs> exactly. Or actually, they would despise each other because they're far too similar. Not sure one manipulative, evil she devil would enjoy the company of another, right? They'd be competitors for the same dudes, probably. Uh, user, user Rachel Petit posts What idiots? Were they, and she's referring to the jurors, were they informed that three months before her child went missing, she had a search history consisting of neck breaking, shovels, how to make chloroform? Plus, she didn't inform that her child was missing for an entire month. People who think she is innocent must be crazy. I'm so sad to see that little Kaylee did not get justice. Exactly. I understand from a legal perspective thinking maybe uh, she wasn't guilty in a courtroom sense, but actually thinking she was innocent, like some of the people in the comment section seem to think, it's fucking crazy. Uh, Sharon True Crime posts, never cried when her baby was found dead, but cries when she finds out she's getting away with it. What does that say? Exactly, Sharon. To me, it says she didn't give a single fuck about Kaylee. She has proven over and over again she didn't care about her family, only cared about herself. Now let's get to some idiotic posts. Uh, user the Hours 1000 defends Casey, posting this in regards to people saying she's guilty. He posts, you didn't see it happen, so shut up. Uh, I don't think you know how crime works, Hours 1000. Uh, you can still be found guilty when no one sees you, uh, if, if apparently you didn't know that. You can be found guilty when there's no forensic evidence tying you to a crime scene. Circumstantial evidence actually can be enough to convict. 
many people have been convicted by circumstantial evidence if there's enough of it. And there was roughly a cubic fuck ton in this case. Trials can be very complicated, still produce a guilty outcome. That's why you still have the trial when there's no eyewitnesses. Be a lot less trials, right? If it was eyewitness or nothing. Just, uh, did you see her do it? Uh, no, Your Honor, but case dismissed. No one saw, so there's no crime. Next case. Casey has a lot of idiot fans in the courtroom. A user born yesterday posts, imagine banging her as soon as she gets out of court. Okay? User uh, Missy Poe posts, I know she killed her kid and all, but I would still totally do her. <laughs> User Dilbert Doe posts, I want to toss her salad. There are about 2,000 comments under this video. I would guesstimate roughly four to 500 of them are comments along these, var like, like variations of these comments. Uh, User Nico posts, if she was a guy, he would have gotten the electric chair. Fuck it, exactly. I agree with this 100%. I also think if she was a much less attractive woman, she would have been found guilty. Casey Anthony being in a, a petite, sexual, attractive woman helped her case immensely. <clears throat> Excuse me. If she would have looked like some big, crazy-eyed, bearded, swarthy dude, you know, if she would have sounded like I do today, for instance, she would have gotten the death penalty. Well, I don't know. Maybe I have a sexy uh, phone operator voice right now. But many, many studies have shown that, uh, un that attractive people are treated more favorably in life than unattractive people. And that doesn't stop with juries. A 2010 Cornell study found that unattractive defendants <laughs> got longer, harsher sentences, roughly two years longer in prison than attractive people. Uh, the study was called When Emotionality Trumps Reason. And it went on to talk about how there are rational thinkers and emotional thinkers. Emotional thinkers are prone to thoughts like, well, just look at her. She couldn't have done it. She's so, she's so nice. She's so small. She's so pretty. I used emotional thinking when I was slutting it up back when I was younger. Numerous times during one night stands, I would not wear a condom. Because I just didn't think that the girl I was hooking up with looked like somebody who had an STD. No way. She's too hot for chlamydia. So dumb. Dumb emotional thinking. And I've witnessed it firsthand during a trial, which I'll explain in a little bit here. I will end today's idiots on a random post that cracks me up because it's so fucking weird. User Dom Jervis makes his Casey Anthony post about himself, writing, I wasn't surprised at all. That prosecutor bears a stunning resemblance to a former coworker the most insane certified public accountant I've ever known in my life. I would have told him to his face and almost certainly would have been dismissed. Wh what? I don't, what? You think that Casey Anthony wasn't found guilty because the prosecutor bears an uncanny resemblance to someone who the jury had never seen. One of your fucking former coworkers. The, who looks, who was a CPA you didn't care for. <laughs> what? Like who, A, thinks something that dumb then B writes it out. And then C hits enter after writing it. And then D doesn't think, what the fuck am I talking about? And delete it. Someone who just thinks, yeah, this is good. This needs to be left here for others to see. Maybe another one of my former coworkers will come across it and be like, nailed it, Dom. That guy's totally Manny Paplinko. No wonder she got off. Prosecutor looks just like Paplinko. No, <laughs> nobody likes Manny. Ha, <laughs> stupid prosecutor. Oh, Dom, you get it. You fucking get it. Of the internet. 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 All right, so was the jury right? And again, if you're a new listener, my voice hasn't sounded like this in about five years. It, just, it hit the day I have to record before I leave, and I won't be back in time to record before Monday. Uh, I've been drinking tea, water. Uh, Joe peed my mouth for 30 seconds at least. Nothing. Nothing's been doing it. Uh, I offered to blow Joe just to see if that would lube up my throat. But we decided not to take it that far because of some kind of weird, I don't know, feelings he has and work situations. He thought it would make things awkward to the next recording. But seriously, this is not how it normally is. So um, was the jury right? Was there just not enough evidence to convict her? Was it too circumstantial? Let's check in with some experts who were interviewed by CNN 10 years after the trial ended. Belvin Perry, the judge, says, I thought the state had proved its case. I thought while they may have had some flaws in their case, there was a high probability the case he would be found guilty of some form of homicide. And that did not occur. The defense threw out a lot of theories. They threw out that she drowned. They tried to build on the inference that the gate was open, that the ladder was down, that she was known to go out the door, go up to the pool because she liked water. There was no evidence that that had happened. The most logical thing that happened, he said, was that she tried to knock her daughter out by the use of chloroform, gave her too much chloroform, which caused her daughter to die. So the judge, years later, still thinks that Casey killed Kaylee and also thinks there was enough evidence presented to convict her. 
Uh, Detective John Allen, who supervised the investigation into Kaylee's death, said, once we tossed Casey's car to the forensics bay, it smelled of a dead body. We listened to the 911 tape. It seemed very unlikely that we were looking for a live child. He says, you know, in any interrogation, you try to find what motivates a person to tell the truth. You try to give them a reason to tell the truth. And I didn't know that anything we would have done with her would have made a difference. I mean, some people, you may appeal to their sense of guilt or remorse. And that certainly wasn't going to motivate Casey because she's never, at least any time that I've ever seen her, seemed to have any remorse at all. So I don't know. I'm not really sure how we would have approached it with her that would have motivated her to tell the truth. So clearly the detective still feels like she did it and clearly still thinks she's a fucking sociopath. And then there's the medical examiner. I found this very interesting. Dr. Jan Garavilla. Uh, the main problem was the jury not being feeling confident that she was murdered, right? Not knowing for sure that she was murdered. Well, the medical examiner basically thinks that the jury just either wasn't smart enough to understand that there was in fact evidence of murder or that they just let themselves be manipulated by just, you know, defense team kind of fucking legal mumbo jumbo. This is what she says. Looking back 10 years, what I was most appalled with was the lack of truth, the lack of substantiated information. You could just say lies, not back it up by any kind of evidence, and it was allowed. That was a turning point for me. This has been happening more and more in the past 10 years, but this was the first time that I had to deal with it in society. Sometimes the truth doesn't matter. And if you say it loud enough and often enough, people get confused and start believing you, clearly talking about the jury. As a medical examiner, we're expected to do a few things, identify the body, come up with the cause of death, why that person died in the manner of death. We don't look at just what the autopsy or what just what the body shows. We look at the scene. We look at the circumstances. We look at what's going on preceding the death. In this case, we have a child that is not reported missing. When the child is reported missing by the grandmother, there is no explanation that's credible of what happened to the child. The body has clearly been hidden. It has been put in two plastic bags, then put in a canvas bag, then thrown behind a rotting log a couple blocks from the Anthony house. Then we have the duct tape that's still present on her face. Those three things together clearly make this a homicide. It's not changed in my mind. It's not changed in the police's mind. It's not changed in the prosecutor's mind. There is absolutely no proof this is an accidental death. Sometimes I think science took a backseat to truth with Casey Anthony. And now my last thought. I served on one jury, a DUI trial that lasted just one day a couple years ago. For my stand-up fans, this happened after my jury's duty. Jury, jury story, excuse me. And the judge knew my jury joke still had me served, which is crazy. That's a whole nother thing. Anyway, this kid, 22-year-old kid, wrecked his truck around 3 a.m. on a Saturday night around Post Falls, Idaho, drove it up an exit ramp to the freeway. So now he's driving the wrong way in the fucking freeway. Passes out behind the wheel. Drives across the median. Drives across the other side of the freeway. Drives off the bank. Rolls down the hill. When the cops show up, his blood alcohol level is over three times the legal limit. They find over six open cans of beer, either in the cab of his truck or near his truck, cans that had fallen out when he rolled down the hill. He admitted to going to a bar with friends at night, admitted to drinking, claims he had two drinks. Yeah, right. Went to a party at a friend's house after the bars closed down, claims he only drank water there and sobered up. Says he crashed because he was tired from a long week of work. Said the accident shook him up and he pounded half a dozen beers on the embankment to calm down. Yeah, that's what happened. And if I wasn't on the jury, he would have walked for sure. One of the other jurors was worried about him maybe losing his job because of a DUI conviction. Didn't want to convict him because of that. What, what the fuck does that have to do with the, the case? He's worried about how this would impact his kid financially. Another juror, this dude was nuts, was going to let him go because this guy didn't like cops. He had a couple bad experiences getting pulled over, thought cops were assholes, thought they were power trippers. And uh, he felt like submitting a guilty verdict would be siding with the cops Dude, when, when, I, when I confronted this guy on this about how fucking nonsensical that was, he literally shook like he was going to have some kind of weird anxiety breakdown. Emotional thinkers. Emotional thinkers, these two dudes. And also, let's be honest, fucking idiots. The dude who hated cops, you know, fucking idiot. Uh, letting his feelings about cops get in the way of a, of a completely separate case. Got legitimately angry. You know, the other guy, just some moron who doesn't understand how fucking trials work at all. Uh, why do I think Casey Anthony got away with murder? Because sometimes getting judged by your peers is a terrible system. Sometimes when dirtbags go on trial, their peers are just as ridiculous and idiotic as they are. Sad but true. Time now for top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, July 5th, 2011. A Florida jury finds Casey Anthony not guilty on counts one through three regarding first degree murder, aggravated manslaughter of a child, 
aggravated child abuse. Casey is found guilty on counts four through seven for providing false information to law enforcement. After getting credit for time served during a trial, Casey is released from prison 12 days later on July 17, 2011. Number two, the last time anyone saw Kaylee was June 16, 2008. The police wouldn't be notified about her disappearance until July 15th, and only then because Casey's mom, Cindy, finally tracked her down, called the police after being lied to for a month. Uh, number three, when initially questioned by the police about what happened to her daughter, Casey lied about where she worked, who was watching her daughter, where she had been for the past month, and more, everything. Basically, Casey told nothing but lies to the police, who were talking to her because they wanted to try to find her two-year-old daughter. You need to know the truth to find someone in that situation. Who lies in that situation? Nobody innocent. Number four, we still don't know who the actual father of Kaylee was. Casey named so many men, and the one dude who looked into it found out he was not the father. There's a good chance Casey herself has no idea. Number five, new info. Where is Casey now? This is going to piss you off. As recently as 2017, she was running a small daycare in Orlando just outside of Universal Studios. It's called Zanny the Nanny's Child Care. And apparently, she's doing pretty well. Uh, she's lost three kids, and that's, fuck, that's not fucking nonsense. No. <laughs> I'd be so messed up. Last time she gave an interview in 2000, this is still going to piss you off though. Last time she gave an interview in 2017, she was living with a man named Patrick J. McKenna in South Florida. Who is he? He was the lead investigator for her defense team. Uh, McKenna was the lead investigator for uh, OJ Simpson's defense team when uh, Simpson was accused of killing Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman. He also helped get William Kennedy, a member of the Kennedy family, acquitted from a rape charge or rape conviction in, in 1991. Casey does, does research now for McKenna, who's over 30 years older than her. In, in my mind, he's clearly, they're clearly fucking. Like, in, in my mind, I, what I re, I'm reading into it somewhat, I admit. She found this old dude, you know, she, during the trial, she, uh, you know, manipulated him sexually, just like she did the dude after dude after dude before the trial. And, uh, you know, talked her into taking care of her after the trial. She's living a nice life. Uh, McKenna funded a photography business for, of hers for a while. Uh, McKenna, she lives in McKenna's house. Uh, she takes pictures like she was when she was actually uh, working at Universal Studios. He lets her do research. And apparently she doesn't care what you think about her. She said in this last interview, I don't give a shit what anyone thinks about me. I never will. I'm okay with myself. I sleep pretty good at night. She also doesn't seem to uh, care or understand how weird it was to lie like she did. Uh, she says, people lie to the cops every day. I'm just one of the unfortunate idiots who admitted they lied. No emotion whatsoever in this interview other than maybe a little bit of a smirk. Such a piece of shit. And that's it for today's top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Casey Anthony has been sucked. I did my best. A for effort. Uh, I did my research. I know I wasn't able to sell it like normal, but uh, I, I still got it done. I, I, can, I got it done. Okay. I'm, I'm sure we'll get some good updates about this one because there's so much info. I edited this episode more than any episode I've ever done. And it still has the longest word count. So much to this but I think we nailed the important parts today. Our justice system, it's run by imperfect meat sacks. And therefore, it, it, you know, it's never going to be perfect. And just like innocent people sometimes get convicted, sometimes guilty people go free. You know, it's frustrating, but it happens and it'll continue to happen. And I firmly believe Casey uh, got really, really lucky with this uh, justice system. Uh, thank you to the Time Suck team. Thanks to the Queen of the Suck, Lindsay Cummins, High Priest of the Suck, Harmony Camp, Jesse Guardian of Grammar Dobner, Reverend Dr. Joe Paisley, Time Suck High Priest Alex Dugan, the guys at Bit Elixir, Danger Brain, Axis Apparel, Heather, Knowledge Ninja, Ninja Rylander for the research. Next week, we're doing another Patreon-supported uh, Space Lizard voted in topic, National Park Mysteries. A lot of weird shit has gone on over the years at our national parks. Uh, we may talk about the Hopi Keeper of Death, the Yosemite UFO, Haunted Battlegrounds, Mysterious Disappearances, Strange Campfire Monsters. Uh, we're going to get weird. Paranormal next week. And uh, I give more details, but I, I don't got much voice left. Uh, I'm, I'll get into it. I'll get in. It's going to be fun. Trust me. I'm going to have my voice. I'm, I got over two weeks now, or two weeks to get ready. I'll be, I'll be healthy. Uh, right now, I'm exhausted. This suck was a big one. Let's get into today's Time Sucker updates. Updates. Get your Time Sucker updates. Today's first update comes in from Thomas Fogg regarding my thoughts a few sucks back on socialism. Communism, the notion that all men are created equal. So informative and well-written. I, I had to share it. Thomas writes, Greetings, Master Sucker. 
I just wanted to open up a quick dialogue about socioeconomic systems, how they affect the quality of life of individuals governed by them and their effects on the world as a whole. Let me first acknowledge that two of the strongest economies, nations, and indeed idealistic structures are the United States and China, a capitalist and a communist, these are both in quotes, nation respectively. Let me also say that while the United States is a capitalist right-wing country on paper, it also has a significant amount of socialist policies, as you stated in your Pedro Lopez episode. On the flip side, while China is a communist left-wing country on paper, it has a significant amount of socialist policies in the other direction. What I'm saying is we both have more in common than either side is willing to agree on. The real problem with labeling China a communist nation is that the description is limited, limited to describing how the monetary structure of the country works and not the power structure. China is a Leninist communist country, as opposed to Marxist communism, where the government has a fascist reign over the people, both economically and socially. For example, there are actually words that are illegal to use in China in public and on social media. But again, the issue most people have with this system is fascism versus liberalism, as opposed to communism versus capitalism. We all know about communist dictators currently and previously in the world, but we often forget about the dictators of the other two systems. Hitler, of course, is the best contemporary example of a socialist dictator. And I can't think of a better example of a capitalist dictator than Julius Caesar. On the other side of that coin, we can actually see examples of countries that were too liberal. The United States' original government consisted of the Articles of Confederation before the Constitution was adopted. The federal government was so liberal, they didn't have the power to collect taxes from citizens. So we see that the Goldilocks zone is somewhere in the middle between fascism and liberalism, regardless of how far to one side one believes is right. While, I'll acknowledge, while I acknowledge the problems with communism, I know you're already aware of the evils and drawbacks the system can have with the best of intentions because of human nature, so I'll gloss over most of it. The big takeaways are the lack of incentive for effort, as well as greed ruining stages of production and preventing actual redistribution. The positives to this system, however, actually do seem to work in smaller sample groups, with the obvious flaw being they don't work on a countrywide basis. But let's, t let's talk about the drawbacks of end-level capitalism, where the U.S. is heading long-term without change. You said you were for the idea of a free higher education system for those who test well enough to get in, and that would be a good idea. While, like Marxist communism, this would be a great idea under ideal circumstances, the sides of the argument against help make the smart smarter, you may not think about uh, you may not think about are the lower class and subsequent minority groups that would be excluded because of this. On average, predominantly white schools have better curriculums, better technology, better school activities, better student engagement. Conversely, the school populations who suffer the most are black and Latino heavy schools. Black and Latino people aren't racially quote unquote dumber than white people, but they will regularly score lower on standardized tests due to education inequality and racial misrepresentation. That doesn't even include the fact that these minority groups are stuck in a cycle of systema systematic poverty or systemic poverty, racial profiling, prison states, societal backlash. As the Netflix documentary series Explained put it, if you were to start a race and the leaders in that race were given a 400-year head start, does it truly matter how fast you are if you can never hope to catch up? True capitalism doesn't take care of the lower class and in fact needs the lower class to stay where it is to work as cheap labor for the upper class. The upper class is allowed to run larger and larger corporations and in turn spend vast amounts of wealth and resources lobbying the democratic government into making decisions better for the few rather than the many. The real problem with pure capitalism as a socioeconomic system rather than just an economic system is that the individual has no power and corporations become the entities the government serves. I'm not saying socialism is the best system, but I do believe it is the most moderate agreement between the socially idealistic Marxist communism and the aggressive realism of end-level capitalism. In truth, neither one can truly exist in practice. But consider this, we, the United States, the wealthiest country on the planet, with the best medical, technological, and agricultural infrastructure, have the highest cost of healthcare and prescription drugs, even the ones like insulin that people literally can't go without, have one of the worst educational systems of first world countries, especially considering we have the largest budget, and according to the USDA, still have one in six struggling with hunger. I'm not saying I have all the answers. I'm just saying there are certainly times when cold logic is the right path. But without idealism and the thought for the little guy, who cares how wealthy someone is in a system? I don't care about the Kim family, North Korea's massive wealth, because the quality of life for an average North Korean is not great, as you found out on your North Korea suck. Lastly, because I know this email is absolutely way too long, and I love that I'm reading it when I had the least amount of voice.
somehow you missed the point of all men are created equal and hit the nail on the head at the same time. The saying isn't meant to mean we are all born perfect and with the same abilities. It's used by Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence when he famously wrote, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. He wasn't saying we were all brilliant military st strategists like George Washington, brilliant thinkers like Benjamin Franklin, or great in history's eyes like any founding father. He was saying that nobody was created better than anyone, even if he did famously own slaves at the time. I'm not saying he wasn't a hypocrite, but like you said, it's okay that you aren't the smartest, the best, the fastest, the strongest, etc. I hope that I, I hope that this email at least gets you to think about different points of view, even on touchier subjects that could be one-sided. If you take the time to read this email in its entirety, just know that even though we sometimes have differing opinions of the world, I still absolutely continue to be a faithful listener. You are a longtime listener and cult member, the nerd with too much time on his hands, Thomas Fogg. Man, thank you, Thomas. Wow. You know, you've written it before and I always appreciate it. I feel like you have one of those Unabomber levels of IQ, my friend. At least an Ed Kemper level of uh, IQ. And I would do an Ed Kemper joke right now, but it would rip my throat apart. Uh, thank you for the well-written explanation. I feel like my perspective has been expanded a bit and the perspectives of the time sick community as well. Uh, yeah, pure capitalism can be a little heartless. I get that. I see that. Uh, and I do think, yeah, I think the capitalism infused with some socialist elements probably would be ideal. You know, uh, it, it's, it's also very hard to process. It's so complicated. It's the reason I haven't done too many economic or political sucks. So many factors, not my area of expertise, which is why I love updates like this. I have so much to learn. Uh, thank you for teaching me, you beautiful bastard. I'm hoping a little what you said sinks in the old uh, brain noggin. Hail Nimrod. Okay, next update uh, is regarding some old-time crime and punishment coming from beautiful UK sucker Ian Kilpatrick. Ian writes, Hey, Master Sucker, just a quick update on the Pinkerton episode. When talking about the hue and cry system in Anglo-Saxon England, you said that the whole hundred shall be answerable for any theft or robbery in effect a form of collective punishment. However, the hundred referred to is actually the name for an administrative area within a county at that time, not the amount of people required to take part. Thanks for all the time, passion, and love you put into the suck. It's a joy to listen to. Keep on sucking, Ian, in Durham, England. Ah, damn it. Well, thank you, Ian. Uh, that does make more sense than holding uh, a random hundred people responsible. Still interesting that the community in some form or some area would be collectively held responsible for catching a criminal uh, before they were dedicated law enforcement officers. Maybe if the community was held responsible for certain punishments, maybe Casey Anthony wouldn't be free right now. Thank you for sucking in from across the Atlantic. Uh, tell, tell your friends. Tell your friends so I can get over there. Uh, pronunciation update from Big Rick. Says, howdy, Master Sucker, the ever noble and hilarious pontiff of the podcast. I discovered the suck through one of your messages while listening to your stand-up on Pandora. Roughly halfway through the Lincoln assassination episode, I realized I'd found my newest addiction. Today I became a space lizard. Yes, hail Nimrod, praise Bill Jangles. Now on to the reason I decided to type this message to you. Listening to the monster of the Andes suck used the word uh, chassis, and because I said it chassis, like I almost did there, and completely destroyed the pronunciation. Common pronunciation would be chassis. This is one of those words that is near and dear to my heart as I am a tuner on my friend's racing team, Wall Trip Racing not the famous ones. Also want to say the suck has helped me through the absolute worst year of my life. Throughout a severe bout of dep depression, the suck was there to help me deal with it. Fuck yeah, man. I'm glad. Uh, looking forward to seeing you when you come to Richmond in August. Oh man, I'm looking forward to getting to Richmond. If at all possible, if you could spare a few minutes to talk to me, that'd be amazing. If you do end up reading this, I'm sorry for the length of my message. Well, I, I will talk to you. I, I've been talk I talk to people I've shows. That's partly why I think my voice is gone, to be honest. It's kind of, I had a lot of people to talk to in Nashville and Huntsville and stuff, but you know what? Worth it. Uh, thank you, Big Rick. Um, yeah, man. Uh, damn, I'm ashamed of myself. I, you know, I shouldn't be allowed to drive a truck anymore or have a beard. Uh, I, should be, I should be only given a thin mustache and be allowed scooter status. I should have to have a, wear a thin mustache and slowly ride a scooter to work because of how I say chassis. Clearly, I'm not a gearhead, but I do think that shit's cool. That counts for a little bit, right? Uh, probably not. I'll see you in Richmond, Rick. Hail Nimra. Uh, another quick pronunciation update from Juan Ramirez, who writes, Dear Socrates, uh, Laplace is a French name, so it's, it's pronounced Laplace. I almost said Laplace again. Yes, rhymes with ass. Now I'd like to share my favorite anecdote about the mathematician Pierre S. Laplace. Isaac Newton's work describing planetary movements didn't match observations quite 100% right, which led him to conclude that God's hand must periodically intervene to maintain stability. Years later, Pierre S. Laplace improved Newton's math and fixed the problems. 
when Napoleon Bonaparte met Laplace, he said, uh, Mr. Laplace, they tell me you wrote this large book about the workings of the universe, yet you never mention its creator. And Laplace's answer was, I had no need of that hypothesis. Boom. Anyway, keep doing your kick-ass work. Love every single thing about Time Suck. Cheers. Oh, man. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, appreciate that one. Um, I had no idea. It, I had so many math people. You know, there's so many math people uh, knew about Laplace. I had some other people correcting me about Laplace. I like, I like knowing you smarties are out there to fill in the holes. Now for a quick and final Pedro Lopez episode update. From Chad, thank you for leaving your pronunciation guide in, for your name. Chaumont. Chad Chaumont. Fucking French names. God damn. Uh, Chad writes, you got me, you time-sucking motherfucker. I'm a truck driver from South Texas, and I faithfully listen to Time Suck while delivering people's random shit. I was listening to the Pedro Lopez suck, and when I heard about the hombre and sino ants that ate a woman's face off in Brownsville, Texas, my neck of the woods, uh, at a nursing home, I immediately paused the episode, pulled into a rest stop, Googled this ant. Nothing popped up. So, so I called my wife to see if she saw this on the news. <laughs> Before she answered, I realized that you got me, and I bought your bullshit hook, line, and sinker. Bravo, sir. Bravo. Anyways, I'm sure you get a kick out of this when you hear about it, so I want to let you know. You got me. I do get a kick out of it. I already bought two tickets to see your show in Houston. Fuck yes. Can't wait to see you. Hopefully I get to meet you and shake your hand for sure. Uh, keep up the good work, bro. Chad Chaumont. Cajun French means sucker of the suck. I, I doubt that's true, but I like it. Hail Nimrod. Give Bojangles a treat. Say hi to the queen of the suck and have a good one. I love hearing that, Chad. Uh, and again, thanks for the phonetic guide. I'll see you in Houston. I think it's a, it's a secret group. It's a cool venue. And uh, keep an eye out for those fake ants, man. Just because, uh, just because I bullshitted about, just because I made them up doesn't mean, I don't know, they could be real. You fucking, you never know. Just be careful. For all I know, for all you know, maybe ants are going to try and eat your fucking face off. So I hope that doesn't happen. Before, sincerely, before I see you in Houston. Thanks, time suckers. I needed that. We all did. Thanks again for listening. Let me do what I love to do, Meat Sacks. Apologize again for the voice. I did my best. We stopped down and recorded. This was a long recording. I would, I would go gargle water. I would go uh, drink tea with honey in it. I would chew on many a cough drop. Uh, I would drink other hot liquids. Uh, I pounded so much water just to try and get it over. Uh, try to use more exfoliants. Blowing my nose. Fuck, what? It just won't. It is what it is. It's just done. Thanks. Thanks for being awesome. Please, uh, please don't care, kids. This week, do me that, fa- do me that small favor. And if you do, fess up. If you kill them, fess up. Don't lie. Don't, don't throw other family members under the bus. And even, maybe more importantly, keep on sucking. It's one thing. It's one thing. It's so hard to do. Uh, podcasting not have a voice here's a weird thing like every job has their thing like I've thought because I, I have weird fantasies in my head all the time I've thought like well even if I got my fucking arms chopped off some maniac cut my arms off maybe cut my legs off if I can bust in my spine you can still I could dictate you can still like just lay me out on a t- table I could just I could record if I lost my sight you can still record you know if I if I went deaf it'd be hard if I went deaf it would be hard but it's possible. People, some people do it. So I could, I could, I could figure it out. But you know, voice. If you're mute, real, it's real hard. I, I mean, I guess technically I could have a, a robot voice. I could just type everything, and then a robot voice. You know what? That's what we need to do. I'm gonna look into that. I gotta make a note. Make robot uh, re- match voice. Get a call. Hold on. Call Elon Musk. And we are friends. Call Elon Musk. Um, I might have lost his number. I can ask Eddie Vedder for it. Call Eddie Vedder when you see him. You know what? I'm going to see Eddie Vedder just in a couple days. We're going to go work on some songs. Ask for Elon Musk's uh, number. I'll call uh, E and uh, and I'll get a get a clone Android AI thing that we've been that I've been programming. Okay, done. <laughs>